So uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, spring has definitely uh, hit the Washington DC area. I hope that uh, it is sunny uh, where you are. It certainly does help a little bit uh, with uh, dealing with uh, COVID fatigue and the stress of national uh, and international news. Um, I wanna just start by acknowledging uh, the very difficult news uh, from Atlanta last week, which really comes in a backdrop of uh, escalating Asian uh, hate speech and hate crimes in our country, which comes in the backdrop of great uh, racial uh, injustices and inequality um, that we have been uh, dealing with for a long time. And I just would like uh, to pause for a moment and make it clear um, that that's been on uh, our minds here at NIH. The goal today is to do uh, a sort of superficial uh, dive uh, into uh, grant writing, superficial meaning uh, that I won't uh, go through every part of a grant application, I won't take lots of questions about eligibility, go into detail of funding mechanisms, but try to give you an overview of the entire process with this really key take home message that your stress level will decrease and you will have much more time to focus on science if you take time to really understand the grant writing process, what to do from your very first idea all the way through the submission and review process all the way to final outcome. And I hope to give you an overview of that today. We're going to, uh, divide this talk into two parts. One is uh, a bit about how to understand the process, how the NIH works, how peer review works. That's with the idea that um, A, NIH is a major funder. Lots of you will submit NIH grants, so you wanna understand NIH, but also from the perspective that if you understand how to, how to explore one funder, then you can do the same for others. And so it's also partially based on a giving you um, a, an understanding of how to explore a funder. And then we'll take a break and stretch uh, and everyone will uh, get up and clear their mind and we'll come back and we'll talk about writing your application. Again, not every part, not every uh, form, uh, not in every detail, but sort of my perspective as somebody who wrote grants for a long time and somebody who reviewed grants for a long time, what some of the key elements are. I think it's really, really key to say something about what we will not cover. So I am not an extramural program officer. I work in the intramural program and I do not know the ins and outs of each funding mechanism. And I really can't give advice specific to you and your personal situation because A, this is a public forum, B, I don't know a lot. And to give good advice means to sit and talk with someone for a long time. So please refrain from asking me specific questions about uh, your uh, goals for a particular funding mechanism or specific questions about a particular K grant or a particular F grant and how do I figure things out. I'm going to give you general overall advice about how to find that information, but I'm not going to give you that information today. I'm going to take questions periodically along the way through the Q&A box, not through the chat. So please don't put your uh, questions into the chat. I can't monitor both of them simultaneously. If we get disconnected, come back to the exact same link and we will uh, try again. If I suddenly go away, rest assured that I will reboot and come back. The slides will be emailed to you after the fact and the recording uh, will eventually be loaded onto the OITE um, uh, YouTube channel. But for now, you can, uh, act, you can find it uh, just through the exact same link. Um, if you uh, 
did not register and want to get the slides, uh, just watch Jackie Newell Hunt, who's here helping out, uh, will let you know what to do. My gut feeling is that when you logged into Zoom, we got your email address, and so it'll be fine, and you'll be able to get the slides. So, um, and I apologize, I was planning to upload them into the chat box and I forgot that you can't upload slides in Zoom webinar, only in a uh, Zoom meeting, so my bad, and I apologize. So I just wanna start uh, by saying that um, we tend to focus on a very small number of grant opportunities, largely the big ones that we hear about all the time, the NIH, the NSF, maybe if you do, uh, uh, some areas of, uh, in some areas, the Department of Defense, uh, maybe you do cancer. So of course, American Cancer Society comes to mind. But the honest truth is that there are incredible numbers of grant opportunities out there from small starter grants to grants for trainees, to transition grants, to really large team-oriented grants. And one of the things that you want to do for yourself is set up a way for you to keep uh, regularly looking for opportunities. Now, some of you are at the start of your postdoc and you might not need to be writing a grant right now. Um, so maybe you don't wanna be checking this regularly right now, but many of you are likely here because you're in a time of actively seeking and actively applying for grants. And I encourage you to find out uh, which databases you have access to on your campus. I know there's a mix of NIH intramural trainees and non-NIH trainees here today. Um, if you are in, in the NIH intramural program, we have access to Grant Forward. At each university, there are uh, the library usually or the Office of Research Services. Um, or Office of Faculty Development, there is some office that provides information like this. And you wanna get good at searching databases. You can set up uh, a search that runs regularly where you get an update. Sometimes we miss a great opportunity because we don't know to look for it. I don't have a lot to say about finding opportunities, except to remind you that this is something you want to uh, get in the habit of doing. If you are in the intramural program, I wanna remind you that there's lots of unique rules and regulations about applying for funding. And so you want to seek guidance from your intramural training director before you apply for anything. But this is a great resource and I just wanted to make sure that people were aware of it. And so now I wanna dive in with the whole concept of learn to un learning about the NIH. And I wanna just start with this really key warning and disclaimer. And that is that the NIH is not one big institution. It is actually 27 institutes or centers and each has a different mission each has a different set of policies and procedures. So grant mechanisms, the rules, support for various funding mechanisms may differ. A lot of times trainees talk to a friend who says, I applied for a K-22, and then they say, oh, I'm going to do the same thing. But if your research is really different and would be funded by a different institute, you can't assume the same mechanism will be used uh, in that other institute, all right? So NCI has its own set of rules, heart, lung, and blood, its own set of rules, genome, its own set of rules, the Dental Institute, et cetera, et cetera. So you always need to start by saying, who might be interested in funding my research? What grants do they have I might be eligible for? So that's the number one key warning and disclaimer that I want to give. The second one is that every one of us who has uh, worked within an environment where grant writing played a big role, each of us has our own opinions. We have our own ways of doing things. We have our own uh, views on what makes a successful grant and what makes an unsuccessful grant, which means that you need to ask many knowledgeable people, not just one person, you want to get input from multiple people, but you want to make sure that those individuals have written grants, that they've served on study section, 
that they uh, are knowledgeable in some way. Furthermore, an amazing resource out there is the Office of Extramural Research website. And it's really important if you want to understand this process that you start uh, getting into a regular habit of uh, checking that website. It's full of resources and a lot of people don't look and then they miss out on really expert input. In terms of uh, just starting into talking about NIH, the first thing we need to talk about are the main types of NIH grants. So um, most grants fall within one of these categories, research training and fellowships are T's and F's. These are for people who are in the middle of training, um, undergraduates, uh, postbacs, graduate students, uh, postbacs, um, I mean postdocs, uh, T and F grants. There is then a whole series of grants called the K series, which are career development awards. These are grants made uh, for people transitioning from one stage to another. One of the Ks that people are most familiar with is the K99R00, which uh, is a transition point uh, with a mentored phase for postdoc and then an independent phase into faculty. So it's for the postdoc faculty transition. There are K awards at all kinds of uh, transition points. The R series of grants are the research grants, the most famous being the R01, but there are a variety of other R grants that you might uh, or might not want to apply for at some time. Then there is the P series, also known as program project or center grants. Those of you at an early step in your career would not uh, be PI on one of these grants. These are grants that pull together multiple individuals at an institution to tackle a big complex problem. At Chapel Hill, where I uh, was a faculty member for a long time, we had a program project grant on cystic fibrosis. The goal was to bring basic scientists and uh, uh, clinical scientists together to tackle this problem from multiple levels. At the start of my career at Chapel Hill, I got a small starter grant from the Center for GI Biology and Disease. That was a P grant awarded to UNC to promote GI biology and disease research on their campus. So while you as a new investigator won't likely be PI of a program project or center grant, you may benefit from it. You may eventually be a co-PI, and as you mature in your career, you might actually become a PI. As you interview, somebody might say some of your startup will come from our uh, program project grant in fill in the blank area of research. So I want you to be familiar with the, that language, but this is not a grant you would actually write at the outset of your career. And then there are a variety of grants that don't fall into any one of these categories and that, that are trans NIH programs, things like the loan repayment program, diversity supplements, the NIH common fund, et cetera. Now, if you notice, I didn't go into a lot of detail and I won't be going into detail because each and every one of you would need to look at these and determine eligibility for yourself individually. And so in this kind of big audience, it would be sort of ludicrous for me to guess which ones of these might be um, most appropriate for you. However, you will want to think about if you're a grad student or a postdoc, go to the webpage where the TNF grants are discussed and see what you're eligible. Same if you're getting set for a transition, you might wanna go uh, to pay the page that describes all the K series and see what you might be eligible for. One of the great things is there is a K kiosk uh, where you can answer questions and then it will tell you what you're eligible for. Likewise uh, for the T and F series. So these are just the main types of grants. So with that basic introduction, I want to give you an overview of the entire process. I will talk today <coughs> about the research plan, which is unique 
I mean, which is which uh, is not unique to any of those mechanisms. And I'm going to talk about the career development plan, which is in T, F, and K grants. But I want you to understand the entire process anyway. So you have ideas that that all starts with you, right? You do the research, you cultivate the ideas, you chat with collaborators. You uh, start to cultivate in your mind an idea of something that might make a really good grant to the NIH. One thing to keep in mind is with very few exceptions, you don't submit the grant. Your university or institution submits your grant. There are individuals uh, there who uh, work with you to get your application submitted but you don't go uh, right to the NIH and submit yourself. So you have an idea, you generate a grant, you do everything needed for your university to approve your grant and they then submit it for you electronically. It arrives at NIH. Uh, it used to be in a big giant warehouse. Now all of this is electronic. So I guess it's a big giant server and it gets assigned to both an institute for funding and a study section for review. The office that does that assignment is the Center for Scientific Review, and they have a branch called the Receipt and Referral Branch. Study sections are run by CSR. Some study sections are run by the institutes themselves. So you're your grant will be assigned to a study section for review. But study sections just evaluate the scientific quality. They don't make any funding decisions. That is made at the institute level. So two assignments are made by CSR, a study section for review and an institute for funding. After the review process happens, the grant goes to the advisory council of the, of the funding institute. So let's say you work on uh, depression. Your grant is assigned to the NIMH. Then, I'm sorry, then after study section, the review and the score goes for discussion at advisory council for NIMH. That's what we mean when we say a two-step process. Right. There is a study section review and then a discussion at advisory council. Advisory council makes recommendations to the institute director. This is an old slide. Um, there should be uh, a woman there as well. Right. There are institute directors of both genders. The institute director and the institute make funding decisions and then money goes out to you really to your university for you to do research. So this is a long process, requires you to interface with the right people at your institution to get your grant funded, requires you to interface with people around the peer review process, requires you to keep in touch with and respond to inquiries before your grant goes to advisory council. And this is a long time. It takes a good long time which is why it can be up to a year between the time when your grant is submitted and when you actually receive money. So it's really key for you to understand this process. Now, along the way, you will talk to several important extramural contacts. One is a program officer. And in fact, when you submit your grant, you'll go to your ERA Commons or your electronic review uh, space. And after you submit the grant, you'll get a notification that your grant was received and it was referred to this study section and this institute for funding. The program officer is institute staff and they manage awarded grants in a particular scientific discipline or funding area. So for example, in NHLBI, there was a program officer who held the portfolio of cystic fibrosis grants. So when I submitted my research uh, proposals to NIH, the program officer was the individual who held the CF portfolio. 
I had a research program that looked at uh, cell signaling in the dopamine pathway. That grant uh, the, would, was directed to NINDS for funding. So the program officer worked in NINDS and handled the grants around dopamine signaling, okay, or whatever topic it is. The program officer can speak with you about eligibility. They can speak with you about fit in the institute. This is something we would be excited to fund. They can speak with you and give you some thoughtful input about the structure of your grant, what you're thinking about proposing. That's their job. They also monitor scientific progress once you receive a grant. So every year you submit an update and it is the program officer who looks at your update. For those of you who are trainees, which I imagine is most of you, um, there is a training, there is somebody with a portfolio in training grants in each of the institutes. And so you might talk to the program officer who handles the K portfolio or a program officer who handles um, all of the uh, fellowship grants. So program officers handle a portfolio of grants and you will interact with them at when you go to a national meeting, even virtually when you stop at the NIH booth, there's a lot of program officers there who can talk with you about what, uh, what that institute's research portfolio looks like. The other extramural person that you will interact with is someone called a scientific review officer or SRO. Now remember, let me go back a moment. Remember that I said that uh, many scientific review officers run study sections for the Sci Center for Scientific Review. So lots of SROs are uh, staff in the CSR or Center for Scientific Review, but some institutes run their own study sections for particular types of grants. So an SRO can be affiliated with either CSR or the institute. This is the individual who organizes and manages study section. And you can think of them as your liaison to reviewers. You can't reach out to reviewers. Reviewers can't speak with you. And if you have a message for the reviewers, like, hey, I want to let you know, since submitting the grant, this paper got accepted, then you go to the SRO. The SRO makes sure that the right people are on study section. The SRO prepares the summary statement for you and uploads it to your ERA Commons account. So if you have questions about, I wonder if this is appropriate for this funding mechanism, it's the program officer. If you have a question about eligibility, it's the program officer. Once your grant is submitted and assigned a study section, if you have a question about the review process, you want to submit an update, it's the SRO. Now, the third person involved in all of this as a grants management officer, I had lots of grants, both training grants and um, uh, research grants, and lots of my trainees had grants. I never once talked to my grants management officer. My budget folks at the university spoke with the grants management officer who made sure that I was compliant, that we were spending money the right way. The two people you tend to talk with are program officers uh, and scientific review officers. You should make sure that you really understand extramural NIH and all of these issues. This is a little bit of an old screenshot. The, the rotating banner here has been changed, but each and every one of you should bookmark grants.nih.gov. You should go there regularly. You can see that there's all kinds of resources for navigating the grant process. There are things about rules and regulations, and then there is information uh, for researchers, for reviewers, uh, research administrators, etc. You can click on this finding funding tab. You can click on this how to review tab. It's really a great website. I can't stress enough how important it is to go and look. As you are learning about the NIH, another thing that you're going to want to do is visit this website. 
This gives you a sense of what the NIH funds. It's called the NIH Reporter for Research Portfolio Online Reporting Tool. You can search awards by location. You can search awards by topic, uh, funding uh, type. I want to see all of the K99s in this particular area. You can search in all different kinds of ways. I used to search the prior iteration of this database um, in my area, just to see what was being done, what was being supported. One thing I encourage the uh, postdocs that I mentor to do is before they go on a job interview to take a look at what's funded in that institution. You can search by uh, program project grants. You can search by training grants, which are grants to the university to train graduate students. There is a lot of information here. It gets updated fairly regularly. It has a really robust advanced search. And it's a very informative uh, um, thing to do to spend some time exploring what NIH is currently funding. You can read uh, the abstracts, which are uh, online and public record. So you want to spend time on the OER website. You want to go to the training and fellowship page, the career development page. You want to go to the reporter and look at funding. All right. All of that is sort of good generic information. But one other thing that you want to do is you want to think about what you do and think about which NIH institutes would be most likely to be interested in that. And many of you do things that could be of interest to multiple institutes. So you study a cancer of the brain. The National Cancer Institute would be a reasonable agent, uh, reasonable institute to target, but so might be uh, the Neurological uh, Institute, NINDS. Or in my research group, we studied cystic fibrosis, much of it in the airway. So heart, lung, and blood was the obvious funding source, but also sometimes in the, in the gut. And NIDDK had a cystic fibrosis portfolio focused on the impact on the GI system. So your goal is to sit and think about what you do, which institutes might be interested in that. Then you can find the funding tab on that institute's website, and you can find out exactly what that institute uh, is interested in. Each institute has a mission. It has areas of focus. It has uh, uh, what we call a request for application. I realize, we realize as a scientific community, we need more work in this area. So you can see both their general areas of emphasis, but also the special areas of emphasis. And the benefit of those special areas of emphasis is sometimes there's actual money put aside for that. So I mentioned that I generally worked on CF, but I also worked on dopamine receptors. And the reason for that was I had gotten involved in a little collaborative project. And then NINDS had a special call for applications on uh, cell signaling and dopamine receptors. And so I thought, well, here's money put aside just for that topic, let me give a try. So you want to be thinking about who might want to fund my research. One of the reasons why when you're at a national meeting you should visit the NIH booth is because those kinds of conversations give you that same type of information. So you'd stop and you'd talk to a program officer and say, here's what I do. I wonder what programs your institute might have that would be helpful for me. Or I'm getting set to write a K99 soon. I wonder if I could get some thoughts uh, about the relevance of my work to your institute, some thoughts on what might make a good app application. You can learn some of that by visiting the website and then you follow up uh, in person. And I just want to say one other thing about this. If you go to these websites, this is where you can find the relevant contacts and reach out by email. So if you go, you, you're, let's go back to that, that you work in something relevant to NIMH. You go to the NIMH website, the, you find the training and uh, career development tab, you go to the K award, you say, I think I'm eligible for that one. 
You click on that at the bottom, it will have the name of the contact person in NIMH. A funding opportunity announcement is the general way that federal agencies and other funders announce that they wish to fund grants in a particular area. In the back of all FOAs are contact information. So this is how you can find out who to reach out to. And I can't stress enough this concept that your research may be of interest to more than one institute. And so you should really think about that because like I said, some institutes have a K-22, some don't. Some might have an RO3, some don't. And it doesn't matter uh, right now what those specific grants are. It matters at the time when you are looking for what you're eligible for. It matters a lot that you make sure that the institute most likely to be assigned your grant actually uses that funding mechanism. Plus, if you take a look at multiple institutes, you may find expanded opportunities. So I'm going to pause here for a moment and take some questions. Um, there are some questions about uh, the pandemic and extensions. As I said, I do not work in extramural NIH and I can't talk about uh, extramural policy. The OER website, uh, grants.nih.gov, has a very uh, robust COVID page and I encourage you uh, to check that out. What is the role of the Institute Program Director? Um, the Program Director oversees the portfolio of grants. They do not play a role in the review process. They do often attend study section where grants are discussed. But they, uh, once the council makes a decision, they uh, work with the principal investigator moving forward uh, to make sure that the gr that grant progress is made. So their role uh, is to be your um, sort of colleague and advisor, but also sort of overseer, making sure that you're making progress uh, uh, on the grant. Um, there's a question about another advanced grant writing webinar. Um, I am not uh, planning to offer another grant writing webinar. Many scientific societies do. If you're in the intramural program, many of the intramural program uh, uh, groups offer some more in-depth things. How do you decide on which institute to choose for the grant submission? So sometimes that's really obvious, right? So for, let's say that you work on um, liver uh, disease. So it would be pretty likely that NIDDK, which has a very large uh, program focus on liver disease would be the institute uh, you would target. But, but at times your work would fall maybe between, it could be funded by one or two institutes. So you think which ones it might be, you find the announcement, you find the contacts, you send them an email and you ask to meet with them. And then they will guide, give you some opinion about what might be the best institute to target. Uh, you mentioned that most applicants submit their grant to the university, which then passes it on to NIH. Does a similar mechanism exist for intramural? Yes. So in the intramural program, you need to go to your training director um, and they will submit the grant on your behalf. There's resources on the OITE webpage. Um, and, um, and if you have questions, you can reach out and I'll direct you to the right person in your institute. Can you speak about how young investigators can get involved in study sections? I don't work with extramural NIH and I'm sorry, I won't be able uh, to address that. Can you apply to multiple funding opportunities at once? I'm gonna give you my opinion about that, which is this is an incredible amount of work just submitting a single application uh, at a time uh, takes a tremendous amount of energy uh, and focus. Um, while you certainly cannot submit to NIH to applications that look essentially the same, um, there are 
Uh, there are guidelines online about if you're submitting a grant to one funding agency and also the NIH to talk about that in the application and explain that. But in general, um, I would encourage you not to imagine that you're going to submit multiple applications at one time. Um, and I realize answering questions this way doesn't feel quite as good as in the room where you can come back and say, here's what I meant. Um, and so I, if I misunderstood that one, please let me know. Um, if I am a postdoc, in what context would my application of K grant, uh, uh, would my application of a K grant be considered? This question in reading it makes me think what you need to do is go uh, to the extramural NIH grants.nih.gov and read a little bit about K grants. Uh, K grants give you funding uh, at a transition. Some of them, uh, you get some money. So like K99R00, you get some money for a mentor phase as a postdoc, and then you get some money once you start your new research position. So the, there's money for you to start your own independent research. So each, some Ks have a mentored phase um, and an independent phase. Some are mentored in the independent phase. So you really need to go to that website and learn about K awards. What are some strategies for distinguishing between a good grant idea versus a paper idea? You know, um, in general, you should think of a grant as the potential for many publications in one area that are interrelated and grow uh, based uh, on uh, various results. So it's an interconnected um, set of experiments. A paper is a single contribution. If you are doing something where you think this is narrowing, Right, I had experiments, but after this, there, I don't know what I would do next. Then it's probably not a great um, grant application because grants are supposed to sort of expand our learning. Right, it's like I have a whole set of experiments that, when put together, provide me with new learning. So that's the way I would think about it. Um, there's some question here. There's a question here about K99s. Uh, people outside of NIH who submit grants say the mentor has to be a full professor who has received at least one, if not more, R01s. I'm going to talk about mentors for K awards later. I think that anyone can be a very, very effective mentor, and uh, many assistant professors and associate professors are successful mentors on K grants. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I can't really address how to get funding if you are not at an academic institution. As I said, I am not an expert in extramural grants, so you will need to go on to the uh, web page uh, and see what you can find there. So I cleared the question box, so let's go ahead uh, on to the next step, which is a little bit about making sure you understand study sections and the peer review process. And at some point, you should watch that video. But now we're going to start again from that point of the Center for Scientific Review, where the, it, the application is submitted. It goes to the scientific Center for Scientific Review. And then it goes to a branch called the receipt and referral branch. Somebody there reads your abstract, they read the title, they look at what type of grant it is, and they direct your application to the appropriate study section and the appropriate institute for funding. CSR, as I said, also manages about 200 study sections. So some grants are reviewed by CSR, but other grants are reviewed uh, by, um, by a study section in one of the institutes. Regardless of whether it is a study section run by CSR or run by an institute, study section members include university faculty, NIH intramural investigators, and industry scientists, so people who are experts in that area. The SRO, remember I talked about the SRO as being the person in charge of putting together a study section. They recruit very diverse participants in every way, from large schools, smaller schools, across the country, uh, gender and race, ethnicity, 
an, an effort to put together a study section that has very broad disparate opinions because that can um, provide uh, the best uh, broad review of an application. Many study sections include a mix of basic science uh, reviewers and more clinically oriented and trans translational reviewers. Um, and so there's a mix. Some members agree to serve on study section uh, as what we call a permanent member, and they serve typically for four years. But every cycle, every time study section meets, the SRO recruits what we call ad hoc members. So let's say the SRO looks at the grants that they are assigned, and there are three of them that use really advanced uh, imaging techniques. And they look at the roster of permanent members and say, maybe we don't have a perfect expert in imaging. Maybe we need a few uh, additional experts. Then they reach out to people and say, would you serve as an odd ad hoc member of the study section. So some agree to go for four years to each um, meeting and some are ad hoc, meaning they go uh, one time, okay? Or maybe multiple, maybe they go two times. So study section is this mix of experts and they're going to sit and review your science. How does your grant end up in a particular study section. And I'm sorry, I flipped these two slides. So we're gonna go back to that again. So one way that a grant lands in a particular study section is based on input from you. You spoke to a program officer, that program officer said, you know, I think uh, this uh, grant would, uh, we would be interested in uh, this type of grant in our institute. And here's a study section that where my feeling is this grant fits. Now, most of you will not do this at the beginning because T and F and K grants have special study sections, um, but eventually in your career, you might have a strong opinion about where, what study section your grant might do well. So for example, when I was writing grants at Chapel Hill, there were two lung pathobiology and physiology study sections. And I just had a feeling that, um, my grants tended to do better in one over the other. So I would put in a letter, I'd really like to recommend that uh, this grant uh, be referred to lung biology and pathology A. So you can actually put input. That is not a good use of your time at the outset because um, it takes a lot of time to develop a history with NIH. But when you're talking to a program officer, it doesn't hurt to say, do you have any thoughts about uh, a, a good study section here. Sometimes they are uh, assigned based on the type of application, like all K grants or all F32 grants go to a particular study section. Sometimes it's based on the past history of the, rev of the review. So if your grant was reviewed by a study section and then you resubmit it, it will go back to that same study section. If you got the grant, you worked on it for four or five years, and now you're resubmitting it for another round of funding, it will go back to the same study section. So there are a variety of things that determine how a grant gets assigned to a study section, some totally out of your control, and some you can offer some input. Now let's get back on track, and I'll fix that uh, bad order in the next uh, time. Um, so study section, what happens, right? I told you a little bit about um, study section selection. So people get together, what happens? The study section typically reviews 70 to 120 applications, a lot of applications. Each application is assigned a primary and a secondary reviewer. Some are assigned a tertiary reviewer. Some are assigned one or two readers. Reviewers read critique and write a summary. Readers provide, they might be assigned because they're an expert in a technique. They're assigned just to make sure more people, you know, we have a little bit more input in this. Readers generally write much shorter uh, reviews. Back when I was on study section, a lot of times readers didn't write reviews at all. Most reviewers get nine to 12 applications to review. 
and they have to write critiques for all of them that they are a reviewer on. So this is a lot of work. And something really important to understand is that you cannot contact reviewers before or after the review. People like to go, they get their assignment in ERA Commons. It says your grant was reviewed, uh, it was assigned to this study section. They follow the link. They look at the roster, the roster meaning the people who were there the last time and the time before. And then you think you bump into them at a meeting. Oh, you can talk to them about your grant. It is a violation of the peer review process for you to actively reach out to reviewers. They should not be talking to you about the review. This is a, a really a principal uh, rule of the peer review process. Remember, who is it that is your liaison? If you have something to tell the reviewers, that is your scientific review officer. And when you go to your uh, ERA Commons, and it says your grant was assigned to the lung biology and pathology study section, it will give you the name and email of the, of the SRO there. Okay, so um, that is a really critical thing to keep in mind. All right, so in advance, the reviewers read your grants, they write reviews, they consider scores. What we're generally told to do is think about grants in the top 50% of the pile and the bottom 50% of our pile. When we get to the meeting, the first thing that we do is we go over confidentiality and conflict of interest rules. And then we uh, talk about grants that are in the top 50% versus the bottom. The idea there is, and people call this the triage list, that's what you'll hear about it. Uh, it also can be called the not, not discussed list. That is, let's say there are 120 applications to discuss. If we discuss all 120, that has to be really fast. If we drop off the bottom half and only discuss 60, we can go deeper down into the applications that are in the fundable range. So before study section actually starts with reviewing, we discuss the grants that we feel are least competitive. And those are put into the not scored pile. And I'll talk about those a little bit later. Then we go one by one and discuss the grants in the top half. The primary reviewer starts and the primary reviewer um, introduces the application, discusses strengths and weaknesses. The secondary reviewer then says, well, I agree here with Sharon on this part, but actually I was not impressed with those preliminary data that she said were so good. Here were my concerns about it, but I was very excited about these experiments. So here's where I agree with Sharon. Here's where I don't agree. Now, at, at that point, we're all giving a sense of, I think this was an outstanding application and I would give it a score in this range. Or I think this was a mediocre application. I wouldn't give it quite as good a score but the primary reviewer speaks first, the secondary reviewer speaks next, then the other reviewers share their thoughts. So the reader and the tertiary reviewer says, well, I agree with Sharon in this part and I agree with Bo on that part, or actually I, I had a totally different response to this grant. Here's why I didn't like it at all, or here's why I loved it. So primary reviewer talks, secondary reviewer talks, other reviewers share their thoughts. Now at this point, everyone else is flipping through the application as they're listening to this discussion. We're taking a look at the publication list. We're reading the specific aims page. Maybe people are debating the quality of figure six preliminary data. So we'll flip through and quickly take a look of that appreciate that mostly the only people who read the grant are the primary, the secondary, the tertiary, if there is one, and any readers. All of us do not read all of the grants. We only read the grants assigned to us. So at this point, 
committee members have been flipping through and we might have a question. So someone who wasn't one of the reviewers might say, you know, I do, I looked at the data in figure six and I have this question. Or somebody will say, does anybody know um, whether the, um, you know, whether um, it, these experiments are reasonable, right? It just looks like they probably won't have enough tissue to do this. Or can they really recruit that many patients? So all the rest of the reviewers are asking questions. At some point, the program, the scientific review officer and the chair of the study section says, okay, we've had enough discussion. And then everyone states their score. And I'm going to talk about score, scoring in a little while. So I'll leave it out a little bit right now. But um, the primary reviewer will say, having listened to the discussion, I actually think I like this grant even better. Here's the score I would give it. The secondary reviewer says, here's my score. Tertiary, here's my score. The two readers, here's my score, my score. And then everyone else votes based on that information. And the reason why I want you to understand this is that this is a big message you should get out of this. You are writing your grant for a small number of people who either can advocate for you very strongly or not so strongly, right? And so you really need to keep that in mind, right? And we're going to talk a lot about how to keep in mind who you're writing for. Then all of the uh, reviewers vote, and then the that means everyone on study section votes. That's private. We vote uh, in private. And then there's a discussion about animal use, human subjects, concerns, budgetary issues, uh, responsible conduct of research, if it's a training grant. Sometimes you can get a great score, but there's a big concern about one of these other topics. So it's important to appreciate that you need to pay attention to all those uh, addendum or other parts of the grant that you have to submit, explaining your animal usage or addressing human subjects concerns. You want to justify your budget. If you are writing a tra uh, K grant, you want to explain clearly what ethics training you will have because you could get a great score and reviewers could raise an issue about that. And until that's addressed, you won't get your grant. Then all of the reviews are submitted to the SRO, and that is what you get from them. You will get the written scores. So how do we actually review? We review based on a framework provided to us by the NIH. And that framework is an overall impact score, and then score in these five core criteria, significance, investigator, innovation, approach, and environment. And this is for our grants, like R01s or R15s, R03s, okay? So different R grants, significance, investigator, innovation, approach, and environment. And then all those additional issues, like whether human subjects protections were appropriate, whether the data sharing plan is appropriate, et cetera. Now, when it comes to a T grant, an F grant, or a K grant, we follow a different set, a, a different framework for evaluation. Still an overall impact, that's the overall score you get. And then the core criteria are candidate, career development plan, research plan, mentors, consultants, and collaborators, and then environment and institutional commitment. So we are evaluating here, the science in the research plan, but also the candidate in the career development plan for training grants and K grants. That's really important, right? Because you need to write a grant that has solid science, but also a solid career development plan and a solid description of why you are such a good candidate for this. Remember in T grants, I mean, in, in uh, F grants and K grants, we are investing in you. It's not just the science, it's you, right? Because there are two criteria on you, candidate career development, right? In some ways, even the mentors, consultants, and collaborators are all about developing you, right? So it's your science plus you. Whereas if you go back and look at the R grant, it's all about the science. 
there's something about the environment and the investigators. Are you the right person to do it? But much, much more uh, of a developmental focus in training and career grants. So the criteria for review are different. The overall impact score ranges from 10 to 90, with 10 being the best and 90 being a very weak grant. And each of the criteria scores are one to nine integers only with one being the best, nine being the worst. One critical thing, let me just show you this and then I'll go back. So one is exceptional. I essentially see nothing wrong with this uh, you know, criteria. Nine being poor, very few strengths, numerous major weaknesses. Three is excellent, five is good, seven is fair. All right, and so these scores um, are for those um, core criteria, the significance investigator innovation approach environment or candidate career development plan, research plan, et cetera. All right, the overall impact score is not a mathematical average of all of those other uh, criterion scores. Reviewers can weigh the criterion scores as they believe appropriate in assigning an overall impact score. So I wanna go for a moment back here. So let's say I review a grant and I think it is exceptional. It is really important. It has great significance. It is tackling a problem that has been up in our field for a long time. And I think it's very significant, great investigators, but the honest truth is I don't think it's very innovative. So I don't give it a good score on innovation, but it gets a really good score on all the rest of this. As I come up with my overall impact score, it is up to me to decide not to weigh innovation that much. Totally the reviewer's decision and each of us is different. That comes into play for training grants and K grants. So some people focus a lot more on the research plan. Some people focus a lot more on the career development plan. Some people weigh both of them in different ways. All of us have different opinions about what the most important core criteria are for that specific application. And so you cannot assume that uh, the overall impact score looks uh, it sort of is mathematically related to the criterion score. This is something very uh, frustrating for new investigators who, who are looking for some kind of ability to look at all those criterion scores and then say, well, clearly this is how it related to my overall impact. But it doesn't always totally look. How does the summary statement look? So you get a score and people tend to focus on the score, but the honest truth is it is what is written that is so important. Reviewers use an actually structured template where they address overall strengths and overall weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses for each of the core criteria, and then comments on other review considerations like animal subjects, human use, et cetera. Um, the idea here was that it would be more transparent for, for people to read the review and understand what's being said if each core criteria was strengths, liabilities, strengths, liabilities. So it is a lot easier uh, to read. On the OER webpage and in some of the resources I'm giving you are links to examples of this so you can see what it looks like. So your summary statement will be uploaded into your ERA Commons uh, some period of time after the review. So you'll be able to tell the date of the review because it will be in the ERA Commons. You will get your score much faster than you actually get the summary statements. All right. But you will eventually get the summary statement uploaded so you can read it carefully. And I'm going to talk a lot at the end about responding to uh, comments and resubmitting. Now, remember, I started by saying the first thing we do is we discuss which grants are in the bottom 50%. Therefore, they're not going to get funded, so we don't spend time talking about them. So applications that are not discussed are in the lower half. 
they do not receive an overall impact score because the overall impact score is what is assigned based on the vote at study section. People always say, oh no, that means I won't get any input, but that's not actually true because you will get the summary statements that have all the written critiques and all the criterion scores. So the assigned reviewers will provide you with written input. There just is no discussion and therefore no vote, all right? Therefore, there's no overall summary at the top and there's no overall impact score. But you will get the written reviews and you can see what it was that they each of the reviewers didn't like. Now, remember that I said the review process is a two-level system. The first level is scientific peer review, that is independent outside reviewers. They evaluate the scientific merit and significance, but they do not make funding situations. They are scientists sitting around a table or right now sitting around a Zoom screen discussing the science in that uh, stereotyped way that I described for you above. Then all of the grants go to the institute identified as the funding source where they are discussed at the National Advisory Council. There, council evaluates the quality of the peer review. Sometimes people raise concerns about the peer review process or um, some issues come up, so they talk about the initial peer review. And then they make recommendations to institute staff on funding. So a funding decision is made at this second level. When people say, am I going to get funded or not? Here's my score. The reason why your program officer says, I don't know yet, is that's not decided until you have a, uh, your grant discussed at council. And I'm going to show you the sort of timing of all of this when peer review happens and then when council happens. Another thing that council does is it evaluates program priorities and relevance. So council might say, we're really concerned. There aren't very many grants focused on uh, this part of our portfolio. What should we do about that? My guess is right now, council everywhere is saying, what about COVID? How is COVID going to impact uh, our grant portfolio, right? COVID clearly is a multi-system virus, right? A, a long haul COVID has impact all across uh, systems, right? And so there, how are we gonna make sure this research happens? So that's the second thing council does. They they evaluate peer review and recommend funding, but they also make sure that the institute is responsive to um, training needs, that peer review is as unbiased as possible. And that's something that we're learning a lot about right now as we look into uh, embedded unconscious bias uh, and potentially conscious bias in the peer review system. So council does more than just rubber stamp the review. They also talk broader about issues in that institute. So there's a bunch of questions that I'm going to try to take now. Um, I'm going to talk about training plans in the next part. Um, so I'm going to dismiss that question. I will get to it. Um, again, I announced there's questions about uh, international researchers and write and applying for grants. Again, I cannot stress enough, you do not want advice from me. I am not an extramural NIH and I do not set eligibility. You wanna do what I uh, outlined for you um, earlier. If you have a question about eligibility for international scientists, you go to the OER webpage, grants.nih.gov, and you look at eligibility. And it is incredibly clear in the funding opportunity announcement, the first thing is the goal of the grant, the second thing is eligibility. And there's two kinds of eligibility. Institutional, who, which institutes can apply, right? Which type of institutes and individual. What are the individual characteristics of this applicant? 
art, their funding from NIH that are more or less international. Um, there is a whole section on the OER webpage for applicants from universities abroad. There are some grants uh, that uh, grant mechanisms where you're not open, you're not eligible if you're at an international institution and there are others where you are eligible. So the same answer. In my experience, what was the score for most successful grants? You know, um, there is no clear answer to that. It depends on uh, the year. It depends on how much funding is available. Um, I have gotten grants um, I, my grants were mostly scored using the old number, so I've gotten grants that would have been like a 225 or a 22 uh, that were funded and grants at that level that were not funded. Um, it just depends on the funding mechanism. It depends on the year. The person who can help you with that the most is after you get your score, you could email the program officer listed in your ERA Commons and say, I just checked my score. I received a 35. Can you let me know based on prior experience whether this grant may or may not get funded? But nobody can tell you that there is a number uh, uh, that, that's just standard out there. There's another question about career development plans and another question about uh, various eligibility. Let me stress again, I will not answer any questions about eligibility because A, I don't know, and B, I would never want to damage you by giving wrong advice. So don't put grant questions about individual eligibility here. Having served as a reviewer, do you have any sense of whether having references for a K award from non-PIs would be viewed as a bad sign? Are only PIs deemed able to gauge your potential? I'll talk a lot about that uh, in the next section, but the honest truth is we want to see uh, um, recommendations from people who know you well and can address some element of your uh, K application. So I shut my lab years ago, and I still write some applications uh, for people applying to K grants because I talk about their career development, their preparation for independence. I talk about other elements of it, and I think that that can be totally appropriate. Um, again, there's questions about visas, and I do not know, and you do not want to hear this from me. Um, what are the most important criteria to consider while selecting the most appropriate funding institute? I mean, for many of us, it's obvious. Like if I work on cystic fibrosis, there aren't that many options, right? And NHLBI has a cystic fibrosis portfolio. So does NIDDK. Child health and ICHD might have some, but it's much more narrow in terms of um, impact um, on development. Um, or in terms of my type of research, much more, much broad in others. We have to look at what we do and then talk to the program officers in those, um, in, in those areas. And the program officers can help us decide which institute is most appropriate. Does NIH still give pref preferential weighing to early investigators? Yes, NIH is very worried about early career investigators. NIH is very worried about the impact of COVID on early career investigators. There are many extensions. There are all kinds of uh, systems in place to make sure that you are uh, really being uh, nurtured uh, and looked at carefully at NIH. Is it possible to get a grant while being at NIH and then use it after moving to an institution abroad? Uh, K99 R00s, uh, the R00 must be at a US institution. If you take a job internationally, you will not be able to activate your grant. You will need to check for each of the other um, grants whether there's a difference. But for the most part, uh, when NIH invests in people via training mechanisms and K mechanisms, there are all kinds of restrictions on eligibility. Our grant uh, eligibility is different. It's focused on the science and can the size. There a reason for doing that experiment internationally. Um, and so the, the criteria and, and things around uh, international sites are very different. I'm gonna talk about resubmissions 
you can submit the same proposal, but if it wasn't funded the first time, we expect you to address the concerns raised. After grants are scored, we get an impact score along with a percentile. What is the relevance of impact score? Does it influence funding? The impact score is the final number. And actually many grants, for example, the K43 at Fogarty, there is no percentile. It is all just an impact score. The percent is a reflection of the impact score. Um, and it is used, it is percentile to um, help normalize across study sections, but if all, um, but some grants don't have a percentile and the impact score is used to make funding decisions. Do intramural NIH fellowships go through a similar review process? It depends on which of the intramural institutes you are in. <laughs> some of them have their grants reviewed uh, through the exact same system. Some have internal systems that look similar. And everything that I'll talk about in the next part would be helpful for either one. Asking about mentor qualifications. Uh, if mentors have many awards, uh, would they be strong uh, mentors, even if they're awards from the CDC, DOD, et cetera? Really, uh, there is no magical description of who would be a great, um, a, a great letter of recommendation if they are well-funded in their area with grants from the appropriate funding agencies, they are a perfectly appropriate recommender. You don't have to only find people with R01 grants. That said, it doesn't hurt to have some people who have followed the career trajectory uh, and have grants similar to what you have. And if that's an NIH R01, then that would be a good thing. But CDC grants, DOD grants, the American Cancer Society, uh, Zuckerberg, uh, Chan Zuckerberg, all of these, right? I mean, if people have uh, funding, it shows that they're good scientists. Uh, so um, I think I cleared all of them. There's another question about the impact score and relevance of the impact score. Uh, the impact score or the percentile generated out of the impact score is what determines funding. So NIH will go to study section and they pick a cutoff. We're gonna fund all of the grants uh, that, are, that range from a 10 to a 30, or we're gonna fund grants up to a funding level of 21% or 18%. So uh, that score is uh, giving you information about the likelihood of funding. And again, you would go to your um, program officer and say, here's the score I got. I wonder if you could share with me your perspective on the potential of funding. And they might say this score most years wouldn't get funded. They, they can never tell you until council meets. They might say this looks promising, but of course I can't say, but they will give you some indication. Are you able to look up a PI's grant on reporter and access the whole grant? No, you cannot. All you can see is the abstract, right? If you think about it, those grants are our intellectual property. And so uh, we wouldn't uh, make them uh, available to everyone. That said, at the end, there's a slide of resources. NIAID has kindly put up five or six grants, the entire application, so that you can see what a successful grant looks like, what a resubmission looks like, how people respond to reviewers' comments. And so I really encourage you to go ahead at some point and look at those. All right, if there are no more questions, it is 2.16. Please come back at 2.26. Uh, We're going to take a 10-minute break, stretch, see the sunshine if you have somewhere you are, and I will be back um, at 2.26 uh, Eastern time. All right, everybody, I hope you're back uh, from break, got a chance to stretch. I'm gonna take the one question um, in the Q&A box, but before I do that, I wanna go back to a lot of the questions about um, international eligibility, eligibility uh, with this 
uh, particular type of visa. And I wanna just go over one more time the best way to get those types of uh, uh, questions answered. Um, because in part, I feel unwelcoming to keep saying I can't answer them, but I, I can't. But also, I even if I knew some of them, nobody knows the nuance and ins and outs of every grant, right? So that funding opportunity announcement, when you go to that on the OER webpage and you open that, it will start with the overall goals and then it will have eligibility. And that eligibility will start with institutional eligibility and then it will go to individual eligibility. You read institutional and individual and then if you have any question or any concern and you want to confirm you flip to the back, you find the name of the appropriate program officer and you reach out and you send them an email that says, I'm looking at this particular funding uh, opportunity announcement, give them the number and I have this important specific question. You can ask to talk with them. If it's really complex, you wanna talk about it, you can, um, you know, they may ask you for more information to be able to answer. That is the way to get accurate advice. First of all, accurate. The second thing is it gives you a written record of what was said, because this is so complex. And sometimes we think we understand one thing and we don't. And what you do not want to do is write a grant you're not eligible for. That is a painful thing right? You put all this energy into writing a grant, you get a great score and you can't activate the grant because, oh, you didn't understand this or that. So again, I want to stress, it's not that I want to be unwelcoming. It's that I know what I know and I know what I don't know and I care about you. And so please use that uh, pathway to getting information. Don't ask your friend, right? Because it could be a different institute, a different, a different grant. Don't even rely on something your PI said because policies change, right? And so it could be that, you know, I haven't thought about that in seven years and I answer based on what I knew then, but now things have really, really changed. So you want to always go to the appropriate funding opportunity announcement, find the appropriate person and ask. There's a question here about what if most of the reviewers give a great score and understood the grant, but a reviewer, the primary reviewer, another one gave a much weaker score based on misunderstanding and ignoring the grant. So first of all, appreciate that what happens is, remember everybody, the primary reviewer gives their score, the secondary says, right? So the primary reviewer might say, using your example, I didn't like this grant at all and I would give it a 50. The secondary reviewer says, actually, I liked it a lot for all of these reasons. I, I am giving it overall a 15. I think this was one of the best grants I read. The readers will weigh in. They might agree, right? They might agree with one person or the other. So everyone gets to put their opinion on the table. And then each of us listening decides what feels right to us. And we typically vote within the range set by the best score and the worst score. Occasionally somebody says, I don't agree with that and I'm gonna give a different score outside that range. But for the most part, we vote within that. It is true that at times one disgruntled reviewer, I don't mean disgruntled, I should change that. One reviewer who uh, was who viewed your grant unfavorably, you're right, that they can impact your overall score. And that can be difficult uh, to deal with. But remember, there's this discussion with the idea of coming to what is really the most accurate assessment of the grant. So I hope that that helped with that. Um, I, I do think we have this sense that the system can really um, be harsh, that one person can really derail something successful. But having been on study section many times, what I can tell you is we listen to that discussion 
um, carefully and, and people will really put their thoughts out on the table, people change their mind. Um, there are many, many ways uh, where the whole system of peer review and the checks and balances of multiple people talking uh, make the system work a little bit better. It has its flaws, right? It has its limitations, but it also has many strengths. And I hope that helps. All right. It looks to me like I cleared the questions. Um, I am going to um, go ahead and move on. All right. Keep putting questions in. We're going to transition a little bit to strategies to, for success. And I want to start, remember I paused earlier and I said, look at that, a primary, a secondary, maybe a tertiary, maybe a reader or two have read your grant. Everybody else is just flipping through, reading little bits of it during the review. So I'm going to come back to that now and remind you of that using this sort of framework of the psychology of a grant review. So Reviewers themselves are overcommitted, they are overworked, they are tired, they may be submitting their own grants, they run their own research groups, they have their own stresses. Also, to be successful in science means that you've developed this really skeptical, critical uh, view of science, right? So you tend not to be looking for the best of the work. You tend to be looking for, well, where are their liabilities? Where are their weaknesses? Where are, the, where are their flaws? And one more thing that you need to remember is they are often only peripherally interested in your work. And I'll use my own example to, to illustrate this. So I am interested in protein interactions that modulate uh, ion transport uh, processes in the airway. I did a lot of proteomics and a lot of uh, targeted protein interaction screens as well. So I got to review a lot of grants that had a big element of protein-protein interactions, um, whether it be targeted or proteomics or yeast 2 hybrid. Sometimes it would be in a model organism that I didn't know much about, wasn't all that keen to learn about but my expertise was relevant to the review of that grant. So you are writing for someone who may know a lot about your work, who, who may know a lot about a subset of your work, who may not be that interested in particularly what you do. I served on the American Heart Study section for a long time. There were a lot of uh, immunology grants with uh, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And I used to say like, oh, I can't keep this all straight. But I'm the reviewer that you're writing for if I get your grant. So you are writing for smart, busy, possibly interested, possibly not that interested, skeptical, critical people. So you need to make our job easy. And you do that by starting early, doing many, many drafts, lots of discussion, so that you write a well-organized, clearly written grant that is easy for me to follow. You have section headings and breaks in the writing. If something is really critical, you might repeat it multiple times, right? So that I can really get a sense of what's special about your grant. You have really well-designed figures, charts, flow diagrams, et cetera. A part of your thinking is about the science and a part of your thinking is how can I present this in a way that makes the reviewer see the strengths of my application. So one is you making it easier, but the second is avoid irritating the reviewers. So don't exceed page limits, don't use tiny fonts, narrow margins. First of all, it may get sent back and it'll never get reviewed until you change it. But anyway, we all have enough to read. And so trying to jam every last word in may seem like a wise thing, but it's not. Don't put information in the wrong sections. Don't mislabel uh, figures. Don't, you know, if you say there are references and I go to the back to find it and there, it's not there, right? That's, that's something that sort of is sloppy, right? It, it, I need to have confidence in the science 
then I need to have confidence in the grant. And the only way you can engender confidence in this system is by really uh, making sure that your grant flows, that the information that you say is there is there. But if you say the arrow shows uh, the specific um, you know, the specific staining that I look up and the arrow is there. You don't want to submit an application that's sloppy and full of typos because sloppy grant submission could equal sloppy science. I know it could also just equal busy or I waited till the last minute, but the way reviewers receive that is I'm super busy. I don't have time for this. And so you want to make their job easier and avoid irritating them. And you want to keep in mind that you are writing for smart, busy, critical, interested to some degree people. One thing, so, so that's my overall comment at the outset. Now I want to talk a little bit about getting down to the nuts and bolts um, of, um, of an application. So it's a big deal to write one of these. It takes a long time, which is why when the question was asked about, can I submit multiple at a time? I said, oh, you would not want to do that. Um, this is a lot of work. You need to think about what else is happening in your life and work right then so that you have the time it takes to do a good job. There are generally three cycles. Grants are due in winter, summer, or fall. There are uh, three cycles of review meetings. So if your grant is due in Feb uh, you know, February, March, April, uh, really February, March, most of the reviews will be June and July. It goes to council in September, October, and it can start in December. So it's almost a year, right? The cycle starts towards the end of January and the potential start dates are in December, almost a year. Then there's this uh, summer one, fall review, winter council, spring start. Now, each of you has uh, the life you have, the schedule you have at work. I have had people tell me I'm going to write a grant and, oh, I'm teaching the first time. So I'll be teaching my first time and writing a grant in February, March. Not a good idea. Sometimes we don't have any control, right? And it just is what it is. But if you can schedule your grant writing at times when you can put the most energy into it um, up front, the better. So I always try to target the February, March submissions because um, when people went away in December, it was a nice quiet time for me. I didn't like submitting in the summer because boy, I'd be like pulled between writing a grant and getting outside or vacation or uh, all my summer, uh, extra summer researchers, right? So for me, this was a bad date. This was a good date. You get to choose, but you should be thoughtful about this when you can. Sometimes you can't, but a lot of times you can. Now, I'm going to talk about getting started and I'm going to start with administration. Remember, you have ideas and somebody at your institution submits the grant for you. There's a lot of administrative steps in between. The first thing to do is download and carefully read all of the instructions and make sure you know all of the deadlines. So if you're going to write an F32 grant, you want to download the FOA for an F32. That's called a parent FOA because many institutes use that same mechanism. So it's a standard grant mechanism and a standard FOA. K99R00 FOA, K22 FOA. Sometimes there's a request for applications when the NIH calls for an application on a specific topic, then you want to download that. You read everything that's relevant. There's parts of it that you don't need to read, but the goals, the eligibility, the application, the deadlines, you take care of all of that. You also want to download the electronic application. Do not Google it, you know, uh, our application uh, template, because once something is put up on the internet, it's often never taken down. So you could be downloading the wrong forms. 
So you want to download the correct forms. You go to grants.nih.gov, follow the appropriate links. You will need to be registered for specific government internet-based applications, right? ERA Commons. Um, there are other ones uh, for submission. Your school needs to be registered for. It can take time to get an ERA Commons account. So if you know you're in, if you're in the intramural program and you know you're going to submit a grant, go to the right person in your institute. Let them know so they can help you get the ERA Commons account. If you wait till the last minute and you don't have an ERA Commons account, you can't submit the application. You want to talk with the appropriate people about budgeting, about approvals, about how you get uh, the grant routed through your university or through your institute. At Chapel Hill, it had to go to our department chair, then the dean of our college, and then um, it went to the provost, and then it got approved and submitted through the Office of Research Services. But if there were two PIs on there, and I had lots of collaborators, and I was in one college and they were in another college, it had to go to their department chair, their dean, right? So it's now going twice. So you want to make sure you understand all of those approval processes. I had to have all of my animal protocols approved before they would submit my grant. If you're working with human subjects, you might need your um, IRB approval. If you have an exemption, you might need that worked out. You need all kinds of required paperwork before the university or the institute is going to hit submit. I think that you need to start all of this very far in advance. I actually think three months is generous. It's really probably more like four or five at the beginning of your career, especially as you're beginning to learn this, you don't know who to go to, it can take time. Remember, you're not the only one submitting at that same time. And so you're waiting in queue for other people. And so you wanna start all of those discussions pretty far in advance. And then one last thing, if you're going to need letters, whether those be letters of recommendation or letters um, that you can use somebody's confocal or somebody is going to help you with a technique you don't know. So collaborators and reference letters, you want to contact people and arrange for them far in advance. So those are some of the administrative things. Now about the science. I like to recommend to people in my lab and people that I mentor to start by reading the literature broadly, not deeply, and then to save important papers for a deeper read later. The reason for that is I find that people spend, uh, they get really caught in reading deeply. It turns out not to be that relevant to part of the grant and it took a lot of time. And so I like to recommend people read broadly, start working on their aims, start reading more deeply. Uh, in areas um, as they go along. Of course, you should be reading deeply in, in some areas all, all along. So this only applies, like you're gonna add a new technique or a new model and you have to start learning about it. People have this idea, I'm gonna stay home and write. And of course, right now we're all at home writing. Um, and there is a really solitary part of grant writing. But there's also a really important iterative interactive. And by that, I mean, you talk to people, you make change, you talk to them again. You want to engage people in your research group. If you're a PI, uh, if you're a postdoc or grad student, ask colleagues in your group, can I talk to you about my aims? Can I show you my preliminary data? You want to talk to mentors, collaborators. You want people to critique your grant now before you submit it. You do not want to wait for the study section folks to tell you what's technically flawed or what you missed thinking about. So the more you get feedback, the better. However, remember that each person has their own opinion. And so eventually you have to decide what feedback to listen to and what feedback not to listen to. I always recommend that people uh, ask themselves how many grants uh, has this person either reviewed or received, right? You want people with experience in the system. And, and that might help you decide whose opinion to take. Your PI is, of course, a, maybe a better expert in the area than others. So that has to be factored in. So you want to get a lot of input from mentors, collaborators, and experts. And then you'll weigh all of it and decide for yourself. 
And I think you want to begin very early to define and organize and plan content. And by that, I mean six months before the deadline. Not to say every once in a while I see somebody who um, has a lot of time and they can do it much shorter. And certainly after you get good at this, you can really cut it down. I mean, I, I, towards the end of Chapel Hill, I could turn around a grant much faster. I had a lot of uh, experience. I had all of my like human subject exemptions, my animal protocols, uh, my data sharing plan. They only needed small tweaks, so I didn't have to rewrite. But at the beginning, there's a lot of clean writing, and it takes a lot of time. I think that it, I'm not saying six months you're working on it full time, but you're writing it, you're putting it away, you're editing it, you're presenting it, you're modifying it. You realize, oh, geez, I need to do this experiment or else I can't sell this work. You run to lab, you try to get that done, right? So six months with going back and forth. I'm gonna talk a little bit about research grants and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about K grants and training grants. There are a lot of different sections of a research grant. Like I said at the beginning, I won't be talking about all of these. But I'm going to be talking about the specific aims and the research strategy. But look at all these other things that have to be ready. The beauty of starting six months in advance is you reach a point where somebody's reading your aims and you're going to present them later in the week. And you can go and do your bio sketch. You can go and think about your uh, animal subjects or your RCR training or whatever you need to do. So you wanna keep all of these parts in mind. You want to download the appropriate forms. Remember I talked about that. And one other thing on the OER webpage is a set of annotated forms, meaning it tells you box by box what's supposed to be there. So it gives some information on how to do things. Study section happens and the reviewers are talking and the rest of us are flipping through. And what we are looking at is your bio sketch to look at your publications, your uh, list of, uh, you know, sort of your description of yourself, where you are, where you've been. And then we often go to your aims page. This is a critically important part of a grant. In your aims page, you are providing an overview of the grant, the big picture, but also the details. So essentially think of it this way. It tells us what your proposal is about and how you will get there, all right? It's not just what it's about. There's not details of how you're gonna get there, but I should have a sense by the end of the aims page what the problem is, how you will address the problem, and what we're going to learn. While there are many different structures, and you will have to decide for yourself, the one that I really like is to start with a one to two paragraph general overview that leads us towards the aims which I list and need to be clearly defined. And a lot of people like to end with a brief statement, putting it all together. I actually didn't like that very much, but I wrote a lot of my grants with a colleague at uh, UNC, um, Jack Stutz, who really thought this was helpful. And after seeing a few of them, I bought into it. And I was like, yeah, this is really helpful. If successful, here's what we will learn. Here's how the field will be moved forward. You should think of this uh, structure, and I don't know, let me turn on the camera. I mean, I know it's on, but let me make sure I can see it. All right, so you can see my hands, all right? You should think of the start of your aims as the bottom of a triangle. Here is the big problem, all right? This is the problem I'm going to tackle. And then you narrow it down a little bit. Here's what we know about the problem to date. Here's what I have done to contribute to that knowledge. And here are the gaps. So here's what I'm going to do next. And you're to the top of the triangle. And there is where you list the aims. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. You start with this broad general information. You add what you've contributed, what you plan to contribute next, how you're going to address the gaps. And there are your aims. The reader has to finish this section convinced of two things. 
that the research is significant and you have a feasible approach. Now that doesn't mean you have to give them every detail, but we have to be like, oh, this is cool. I can't wait to learn more because then I can go to the rest of your application and learn more. The aims should be clearly and concisely stated. And a lot of people use sub aims and I'm gonna give you an example of that in a moment. Now, a lot of people say to me, and you have to have three aims, right? And that's not true. You can actually, most successful grants are anywhere from two to four uh, related aims. If you have like six or seven aims, one of two things, it's either way too much and it's really two grants or three grants and you have to pare it down or you have written it like figures in a paper as opposed to uh, an aim that consolidates multiple experiments to um, address one problem. This is why you want the aims page written early and you want it read by many, many people. Most junior uh, early career scientists and plenty of us way late in our career put way too much in grants. We get nervous and we say, that's not enough. Let me give them one more thing and one more and one more. So if you have, find yourself with six or seven, ask yourself, am I overdoing it? Or are these really need to be consolidated into aims? If you only have one uh, aim, ask yourself if it's so big that it needs to be subdivided, but generally two to four. People say really three is the best. You have to give them something really exciting in the third aim. The two best scores I ever got. And uh, for one of my trainees, best score, two aims. So a lot of grants have two aims. I don't know where this idea that they all have to be three comes from. A really key thing is this can't be a linear progression. I do aim one, and if I'm successful, I can do aim two. And if I'm successful in aim two, then I can do aim three. Later aims can't be totally dependent on the success of previous aims. Or else, if you're not successful in aim one, the whole house of cards falls apart. The whole grant doesn't work anymore. So they are related, but they can't be totally dependent. So you can think of uh, asking yourself that at a regular basis. If there is something absolutely needed for the success of your grant, you have to be able to show that you're on your way. You have to have some preliminary data. So aim one can't be to generate what you need to do aim two and aim three. It could be that some of what you will learn in aim one will drive the direction of some things in AIM-2 or AIM-3, that's fine. As long as it's not totally dependent and you have multiple options based on the earlier results. But it's really important. It cannot be linear. I said that a lot of people use sub-AIMs. I wanted to give you an example of that. This comes out of one of my grants. The aim is to study the role of uh, this is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, and this is filament and active binding protein. Study the role of the CFTR filament interaction and CFTR folding and ER expert, expert, export. <laughs> okay. And then I explain why, right? I say we found this, right? We further found this. These results suggest that the association with filament plays a role in the maturation or stability of CFTR. Therefore, we will, or thus we will. And then 1A, 1B, 1C. And so I tell people, what am I going to do to tackle that aim? Now, the reason I like to do it this way is it helps me organize the rest of the application. It makes for an easier organization and reading. The other thing is that it helps people really um, understand what I'm proposing. I find when I don't include these sub aims um, and I just say, so we're going to study, complete study, compare, you know, just a sentence or two, that it's harder for people to understand what I want to do. So over time, I've adopted this strategy of listing sub aims. Some people don't use sub aims. Some people really like them. You get to choose, but I thought I would show you an example of what I mean by that. 
A really key thing about the AIMS page, this is your hook. I don't know how many study sections I've been on for so many different organizations. When I read the AIMS page and I'm excited, I take a lot more time to read the grant. I'm more open to trying to figure things out. It's like, oh, I'm excited. I'm going to learn something. This seems cool. And when I'm really frustrated at the end of the AIMS page, I say, oh, this is going to be hard. I'm going to put this at the bottom and I'll do it last. And then I run out of time or I'm rushed. I'm already irritated because I can't really figure out from the AIMS page what's happening. You want this AIMS page to be really, really uh, your best work product. You want to write it. You want to get a lot of input. You don't want to be doing lots of parts of the grant till you agree on the AIMS or else you're going to be writing things that aren't going to end up in your grant and you're going to be wasting time. So you really want to give this some thought. All right, I'm going to clear some questions and then uh, we'll move on to the research strategy. So oh, I can't seem to get this to move. All right, there's another question about bias and reviewers, some reviewers liking it and some reviewers uh, not liking it. Again, there's discussion at the study section. Everybody gets to ask questions if uh, and then we judge our thoughts about um, where everybody's critiques are coming from. There is also a pretty strong conflict of interest section. So um, uh, if you've worked with somebody, if you've published with them, if they're at your same school, they can't be uh, a reviewer. So there are a lot of things done to hopefully make the peer review process as fair as possible. When you present a proposal, what's the good fraction of already published versus preliminary work? You know, everybody has a different opinion about this. I think that you should have a record of uh, solid publications that form the basis of your work. Um, it depends on the type of grant, uh, how many publications you need to show productivity, but um, much of the, you can put a lot of unpublished uh, data in your preliminary results. And I wouldn't give a specific number for that. Can you elaborate a little bit about the scope of aims and independence? If there's a hint of interdependence, is it acceptable to put an originally independent aim as a sub aim? I'm not sure I understand the second part, but what I'll say is that sometimes we have preliminary data that tells us this is going to give uh, really um, uh, important information that will drive the next section. If you have some good preliminary data that says this is going to happen, then you're fine with that uh, interdependence, right? If you have a mouse model and uh, your entire aim is to make the model, that's risky. But if you have preliminary data that says, here's where I'm at, uh, I've, I, you know, this is looking like a go, here's my preliminary analysis of this model, then the fact that there's some interdependence is fine. So it's not something where you can give a precise answer. That's why you want to write these early enough to get lots of seasoned people to, um, to read it because you'll have people read it. And if one person says, oh, this is too interdependent, bad idea, but three other people are like, this makes sense to me. Do you have these preliminary data? That would help, right? Then you can weigh the different things. That's the idea between, behind getting lots of people to read it. There's a question about a hypothesis in each aim. A lot of people talk a lot about making sure each aim is hypothesis driven. I'll be honest and say, I, I did not always have hypotheses. I did some discovery work that was funded. I sometimes got dinged hard for um, some of the discovery work. I sometimes pitched discovery work to private funders like the CF Foundation or American Heart Association. Um, you will each develop your own um, way of dealing with that and you all do different kinds of work all things being equal, it is good to use language of test the hypothesis, but it doesn't have to be that you hold yourself only to that. Again, each of you will have to decide that for yourself. 
Should you include sub aims towards the beginning too, or just later on when you go into detail? I like to list them up front and then uh, refer to them later. I think if I didn't list them up front, I think it would be surprising and hard to for people to wrap their head around, but I've never seen one that way and it might work. So you'll want to write it however you think to write it and get feedback on that. Is it mandatory to have preliminary data? I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Define perfect grammar, science, grammar, and science. Um, I mean, nothing's ever, I mean, the word, per, I probably shouldn't say perfect, right? Nothing's ever perfect. Um, just make it as strong as possible, that it's tight, cohesive, people can understand why it's important, um, that you put your best foot forward, and that it be written as clearly as possible, so both. Is there a minimum period of funding? Could I get funding for only one year? There are some agencies that have short-term grants. There are some intramural grants that are a year. The Intramural AIDS Research Fellowship, which we're, we just sent the call, in the out, uh, call for applications out, that's one year. Um, but most grants at NIH uh, are two, three, or four years. What if I don't have a published paper in the field I'm proposing? If someone has studied neuronal regeneration, publish several papers, but the grant proposal is on uh, neuroblastoma and not neuronal regeneration. So you have to, you know, you have to sit and ask yourself, how close is this work? What type of grant is it? If this is for a K grant or an F grant where you're supposed to be learning new things, then that would be absolutely fine. But if this is an R grant and you're supposed to already be in this field and, and have, um, you know, showing yourself to be an investigator that can contribute, that there may be some risk to that. And so you'll need to decide when is the best time to submit a grant. You know, I switched fields from my postdoc into my uh, faculty job, and I actually did it, some of it both quite dramatically and quickly, but some of it very, very slowly. And at one point, the chair of my department said, this is a great idea, but you need to get a paper before you even think to submit. But there were other times where the grant mechanism uh, really lent itself to, um, uh, to submitting without a paper, but generally the closer the paper is to the field, the better. Again, one of the things that's really important is these kinds of workshops are good for getting big, big pieces of advice. Then each of you needs to sit with relevant people and talk about your situation. Um, and then there's a comment here that the AIMS page sounds like the abstract of a paper. It needs to be uh, interesting enough and clear enough that somebody uh, wants to write further. And that's true. Um, question about publications, clarified it was a K99. You know, the idea of a K99 is that you are growing and learning and expanding your toolkit. And so uh, while, again, I would say all things being equal, you want to have some preliminary data that shows you can work in the new model, that you have exciting direction. Um, and all things being equal, it's nice to have a publication in that new area. I know of people who submitted uh, before their publications came to fruition who had success. Again, no obvious direct answer, uh, but there are times when it would be appropriate without um, uh, without a, a paper. Have I seen a candidate dinged forever failing to convince the reviewers they can make it as a PI because they're not dreaming big enough uh, because we have to <laughs> pitch something feasible? Actually, the honest truth is that uh, most of the K grants are short periods of time. And so you can show that you're thinking big in the candidate statement. You want to propose doable science. Um, if the AIMS page is similar to the abstract, what should be different? I, actually, it's not the same as the abstract at all. It's very, very different. The point she was making is just it's the same concept that people read it and you want them to be excited about it. The abstract um, is much shorter than the AIMS page. Um, they're, they're not, I, I didn't mean to say that they were exactly the same. Um, and I don't know the question about when, whether, and I imagine that they do accept preprints, but I, you know, it's been a while since I submitted a grant and I don't follow the rules and regulations. Again, you know where to find that now in the FOA, 
the funding opportunity announcement. It will tell you exactly what can be listed in your um, biosketch. It will tell you what you can include. Um, I used to send uh, update on publications. Um, I occasionally send a preprint, but for the most part not, people could go and get them themselves. But you will need to check. All right, so that's the abstract. I mean, that's the aims, I'm sorry. Let's talk about the research strategy section, which essentially has three parts, significance, innovation, and approach. Approach is preliminary studies or a progress report if it's resubmitted, and it has your experimental design and methods. So I talked about this already, but as you're putting this part together, you need to remember that your grant will be read by experts and people who are smart but don't know as much about your field. And they may be experts in a closely related but not exact field. So your application needs to appeal and be written for both uh, with an eye towards providing expert information, but enough background that non-experts can understand. All right. Sorry. And that's a really, really key thing. Another thing is we're reading a lot of these. I think I said nine to 12. Sometimes a new reviewer can get only seven, but still it's a lot of reading and it's really in depth and technical. <coughs> so you want in some way to convey enthusiasm. If you are not enthusiastic when you're writing your proposal, it's not likely that I'm gonna see it any differently, right? Somehow you need to write strongly enough that we have a sense of your confidence in the data. You know, you, if, if you think there's a key piece of data that says this is an important aim, you want to make that really clear, all right? So in that previous example, that aim I gave you from my work, there was a patient, a mutation in patients, a disease causing mutation, F13, S13F. That, that impacted that interaction. And to me, that was really key, right? It's a disease causing mutation. The protein interaction was disrupted. If I don't make it clear how significant that is, how will an expert who doesn't know much about CF decide how important that is? So you are trying to put together this section, keeping in the back of your mind, that you want to make it really easy for the reviewers to decide what is important, what is significant, what is exciting. And that starts by putting together a really strong significance section. And in this section, what you are doing is stating the importance of the proposed research. I like to tell people to think of the significance section as looking backward and forward, meaning here's where we were and what we don't know and what we need to know. And here's how I'm gonna help us get there. Looking forward, this is what I'm going to do. Because of this gap, I'm going to do that. So you are sort of looking forward and backward. Sometimes people ignore big controversies in the field they think, well, my grant favors one model, so I'm just going to talk about that model. But it's really important to point out controversies that your work might address or big gaps or discrepancies between people's research that your work will address. And one last thing, the significance should be appropriately referenced and you should have an honest and balanced discussion of the field. This is not where you list just what your research group did and ignore everything else. And because we're gonna say not a very balanced view of the field. It is absolutely fine to point out what you did that you feel is important and what your group has shown, but it's also important to give a broader sense of the field, all right? So it's really key to keep that in mind. The significance is why is this important, all right? What is, what is it about the work I'm going to do that will address a problem? Sometimes people think significance is 
this disease that's bad. And while that might be a part of it that you mentioned disease, you have to go much beyond that to what is the, um, what is the question, the gap, the issue that you will specifically address. Another key, so remember significance is one of the core criteria. Another one is innovation. So innovation, aims to address these kinds of questions. Are you using new technology? Is the proposed work new? Are there novel theoretical concepts, novel methods, novel interventions, right? Um, what is innovative about what you're doing? This was added years ago by um, Harold Varmus when he was NIH director to spark people to do research that was bigger right? Not sort of the safe next set of experiments, but really cutting edge innovative research. And now this is a part of the review criteria. Sometimes we use uh, a state-of-the-art technology. Sometimes we are developing a really critical resource. You know, a lot of times innovation comes from a unique model, uh, a unique uh, set of uh, approaches. You know, this one is one where some people get really stressed. They try really hard to come up with innovation. They'll write a whole aim uh, just to be able to say their work was innovative. Fake innovation will get you in trouble. Innovation without solid reasons, uh, without preliminary data. So be cautious and don't make something of nothing. On the other hand, pause for a moment and say, am I doing any part of this? Uh, that is innovative. If there's anything that I'm doing that's innovative, how can I articulate that? And in those examples that I'll refer you to at the end, you can see some of that. There's always discussions uh, about whether innovation, uh, I mean, a lot of really important science is not always innovative, right? The innovation happened and laid the groundwork for us to do some really impactful, significant work. So people have lots of mixed opinions about that. I find early career scientists often focus a little bit too much on uh, innovation. So now I want to talk about the next part, which is uh, really um, what uh, we refer to as impact. And the review was really uh, when we changed review criteria or when NIH changed review criteria, what they did it for was to focus more on impact and less on details of the approach. If you think about it, impact of your work is the significance of the work coupled with feasibility or your ability to do the work. So you could have a really, really significant problem that you say you're going to tackle, but you can't do the work you say you're going to do. Well, there's not going to be much impact. On the other hand, you can show that you can really do the work, but it's not an important problem. So the significance is low. So then there's not a lot of impact either. It's just work for work's sake. And so really impact uh, combined significance uh, and feasibility. I already talked about uh, significance. If you think about it, feasibility equals preliminary data. All right, so this is where you need to have some preliminary data in this uh, section, right? You need to show that you can do what you said. Now, there are grants where it says no preliminary data are needed. It's very, very clear as you read the FOA. Um, even there, some preliminary data could be helpful. Um, people asked already, I have preliminary data in one model, but not the model I'm proposing to use, it depends, right? A lot of times that's okay. Sometimes that's not okay. Really, in all cases, you need to sit and think what preliminary data would be best here? What preliminary data could I live with if I can't get best? And sometimes we don't have preliminary data for everything. And so then we try to think about how can I convince people I can do that? And we can have a consultant who's going to help us. If it's a K grant, it's completely reasonable to say, I don't know how to do this. This is one of the big goals of my K. And here's the person who's going to teach me. Please see the attached letter from that person. All right. So you don't need preliminary data for everything, but you do in general want to have preliminary data. 
So I like to ask people to consider these first three bullets when it comes to preliminary data. This is why we put it in there. One is we show that we can do what we say we're going to do. So I say I'm going to do this. I have the reagent and the ability. Some preliminary data we put in to generate excitement and enthusiasm for the proposed studies. Right? Like I make a case, this protein-protein interaction is important. I got to give them some preliminary data to show them that. Just for me to say, wow, I'm excited about this doesn't mean anything. So I put in preliminary data to say, see, it looks like it's important. The third reason we put in preliminary data is to show we're careful scientists and that we understand the values of controls and that we don't overinterpret data. Some pieces of preliminary data cover all three of these. Some pieces of data really are targeting here. I can do this, right? Uh, it's not really related. I say I'm going to use, um, you know, I'm going to use flow cytometry. I haven't done a lot yet with these cells, but I'm learning how to do it. And here I show you that I'm, I've done it with some other cells. I'm learning how to do it. So sometimes it just shows that we can do what we say. Sometimes it covers both of these. Every bit of data we put in should show that we're careful and that we understand controls and that we don't overinterpret. A lot of times what, when I was on study section, what I noticed was people put in not very good preliminary data, but it sort of was suggestive of, of something. And if they had only said these, uh, these data, which need uh, verification and additional work suggest, it would have been okay, but they were, they hyped it like really important. And then we're like, oh, is this person very careful? Or somebody puts in data and they leave out key controls. And this is not like a paper where we talk about controls and, um, you know, we don't necessarily show them here. I have to decide if I'm going to get something out of this grant. The reviewer is like, are we going to learn something valuable? And if there are not appropriate controls, how do I know? So you want to be thoughtful here about trying to show some controls or at least talk about controls. All right. But I personally, as somebody who reviewed a lot, I would always want to see some controls because then I'm like, this person is careful. So if these data are careful, I can imagine that these other data will be careful as well. You should be really thoughtful about your figures. They should be large enough for us to see. They should be really uh, labeled nicely, clear legends. This is your friend in writing a strong application. And then one other thing, people say, I'm not going to include any of those data because they're published. Some reviewers are very diligent and will go look at your um, prior work. Some people are super busy. They're writing a grant of their own. They have to teach something's going on in their personal life. And the last thing they're going to do is go check your paper. So if something is really key and you have the room, you want to go ahead and put it in. You don't have to go way back. You don't have to show it five times, but you might want to show a, a bit of the data. So you have a section on significance. You have a section with preliminary results. This can all be uh, sort of embedded into your research approach, but I'm just presenting them separately. The research approach should be organized based on your specific aims. And that's why I said in response to the earlier question, if you are going to use sub aims, you want to introduce them earlier so that you're just reiterating them here. You should have an overview of approach and a rationale for why you're doing the experiment. Right? Don't just tell me what you're doing. Tell me why you're doing it and an overview of how you're doing it. You want to define controls, both positive and negative. And we want to see that you've thought through feasibility, sample size, data analysis, right? Not just churn and burn experiments, but you've thought about why am I doing this? What do I need to do to make sure I learn something from it? How will I rigorously analyze it? So we don't want to know the details of the amounts of time necessarily or the concentration of everything. We want to know the big picture, all right? If it's human subjects, 
What are your criteria uh, for inclusion? How will you recruit people? Will you get enough people to have the power needed uh, to make uh, uh, findings at the end? So have you thought through sample size data analysis? One of the things that can be very powerful in the research approach is to wrap up each section with a discussion of what you expect to learn, how you will analyze the data, and any potential problems, pitfalls, and alternate approaches. So that shows that you already have thought about what could go wrong and what you could do instead. You don't need an alternate approach for everything. Sometimes you have so much preliminary data that you say, my preliminary data suggests that I can complete these analyses. Um, I am concerned about this or that, right? You don't have to have an alternate for everything. But when you are doing something likely to be really complex, difficult, that might not turn out, an alternate approach can make a really big difference. In fact, a lot of times when you ask reviewers, what do you look for in a strong research plan, you see an echo to these bullets here, the outcomes, the data interpretation, problems, alternates, etc. So in fact, that's what I did right here. This is a slide put together from multiple panel discussions with reviewers about strong research plans. And these are not in any important order. These are all ones that come up again and again and again. And one is that you can really clearly understand the rationale for the proposed experiments. So sometimes people assume, well, I'm writing for somebody who knows my field. I don't need to explain the rationale, but you're not, right? You're writing for people who might be peripherally knowledgeable about your field. So you want to explicitly state the rationale. You don't want to assume that we will just intrinsically appreciate or understand what you intend to do or why you're doing it. Really strong proposals are easy for us to follow. And in many cases, <coughs> especially given the shorter page limits, <coughs> excuse me, one second. I'm sorry, I drank and spoke at the same time. Not a good idea. Given the page limits, sometimes you are really crunched and a really beautiful flow diagram can help us understand a really complex experiment and protocol. Suddenly we understand when the patient's coming, when samples are collected, how much time, what's gonna happen. Whereas if we read the words, we would be like, oh, this seems really complex. So lots of really strong proposals have really well-designed, easy to follow figures and tables. If you are <clears throat> proposing uh, human subjects research, if you know that reagents or resources or sample size could be limited, then you address priorities, right? Sometimes we'll read something and it will be like, there is a proposal to analyze these 20 genes. And, uh, and somebody will say, what if they don't have enough? What's their priority? And if you didn't tell us what your priority is, then we can't know and we're going to be worried about it. So you want to think through priorities in data analysis. You also want to include a discussion of how the data will be analyzed and interpreted. We are very worried about um, the impact of irreproducible data, about people not doing double-blinded experiments, backing into statistics after the fact. So you want to take care of all of these things. And then I, I already talked a lot about pitfalls and alternate approaches. When you show that you have thought through the issues, then we believe we're going to get something for our money no matter what. But when we get this impression that you just hope everything works out, we don't even know what your thoughts are about what might work or what might not work, then it's a problem. Something that uh, I often uh, had to deal with was I was going to do a protein interaction screen where I could find one thing or 10 things, or you look at a gene expression and it could be one thing, you know, one gene changes or 200 genes change. Uh, you're going to try an intervention, right? And, uh, you know, you could get 
uh, multiple different outcomes. How are you going to prioritize? How are you going to, if you get uh, too much information, how are you going to focus on the most important? If you get very few findings, how are you going to work those up? So strong research plans really give you a sense of what could happen, what you might learn, how you will deal with it. So I'm going to stop here and take questions on the research plan. There's a question about R36 dissertation grants and key points to consider. I would read the uh, FOA see carefully what they ask about and make sure you address that very, very often. They want proof that you will uh, be fit, able to finish in the time that you laid out. They want to know exactly uh, what, you, uh, what support you will have to do that. So the key to most dissertation completion grants is directly addressing the questions uh, that there are because they're really made uh, they're, they're really designed to help you finish up. A flow diagram is, say you have a really, really complex treatment, you wait certain amounts of time, you do these analyses, uh, you know, um, there's another set that goes a longer amount of time. A flow diagram shows all of that in a picture as opposed to describing it in words. So it's essentially a schematic to explain your work. I'm not gonna talk about letters of recommendation because I'm gonna talk about that uh, uh, later. There's a question here about whether I recommend a figure to illustrate the aims and how they're connected. It's interesting that you asked that. I mentioned this guy, Jack, that he and I wrote a lot of grants together and he used to love to make those. And again, I first I'm like, why does this help? But then, um, I would read the grant and it was like, oh, it's all laid out here how these three aims interrelate to address this question. So if you can come up with something that illustrates the aims and how they're connected, that's a great thing. You don't have to have that, but, um, but I think that it can be really helpful to have it. Um, not everybody does and not all of the time. I'm going to again answer recommendation letter questions later. Um, would strong preliminary data help address some uh, interdependence of the specific aims? Yes. So, um, you know, let's say you really need a set of cell lines to do uh, some of your experiments in AIM 2, and a part of AIM 1 is to generate those and characterize them. Well, if you have two out of the four generated or three out of you know five generated and a little bit of preliminary data, then I'm thinking, well, this is gonna go. I'm gonna learn some things for this and then he can or she can use these reagents for some other things. How cool is that? But you'd have to have a lot of preliminary data for me to feel really good about that. And even with that, some people might say, well, the most important one isn't made yet, and that's really a problem. So again, one of the things I think that's frustrating is there is no perfect right or wrong answer on these. It depends. It depends on everything else you have. It depends how key that one thing is. But some interdependence issues can be dealt with by really strong preliminary data. There's, uh, there's more questions about the K grant. So let's go on to that. All right. So K grants are different. There's 12 pages, but you have to have uh, a candidate uh, section as well as a research strategy section. The candidate is background career goals and career development plan. And there's already questions about what's in there. So hold on and I'm going to get there. All right. The candidate background. Remember I said the significance was looking backward to the problem, bringing us to the present and then looking forward how you're gonna solve the problem. In the candidate background, it's the same thing. Where have you been? Where are you now? And how do these relate to where you want to go? All right, same idea. So you should highlight prior training and how it relates to your long-term career goals and your current objectives, why you chose the mentors you chose, the projects you focused on, the activities you engaged in. Those are two things to highlight. 
You also need to explain your current responsibilities at NIH or wherever you are and how they relate to your proposed K activity. So if you talk a lot about wanting to uh, develop your management and mentoring skills, it might be great to hear what you're doing at NIH to develop that. If you're a clinician scientist, you know, how are you splitting your clinical time with your research time right now? What, what are you learning in both arenas that will be helpful? So you are highlighting your past and your present with the goal of that's there to make you an independent investigator using this grant mechanism to promote that. If your research focus has changed directions, it's absolutely fine. It doesn't have to be linear. I've worked in the same field. You can explain why after grad school you changed fields. What you learned in grad school then you use as sort of transferable and you move on. Some people really dramatically change directions, right? They worked in Drosophila and then decide in postdoc, I wanna learn mouse work. Or they started at bench work, they went and got a degree in epi and they want to do more population-based research. You can make big changes. You just have to explain how it all fits and makes sense, all right? So that's the candidate background, all about you. You need to write this in the first person. I did this. I decided to do that. My goals are. I feel that I have these gaps that I need to fill, right? So this is all about you. The next section is a career goals and objective section. And that's about what do you want to do in your future career? And that's in your research, but it's also beyond teaching, mentoring, clinical work, field work, et cetera, all right? So in large part, it's what you wanna do research-wise, but it's also this sort of big question of how do I wanna place myself within the scientific enterprise, all right? So it's a little bit bigger than just, I want to answer these research problems. You want to address in this career goals and objectives how this grant prepares you to apply for other grants, right? And how the K award or the F award or whatever young investigator award you're applying for will facilitate that process. And of course, if I get this money, it looks good. If I get this money, I can do science. So those are sort of obvious. It's what will you learn? What will you take? You know, how does this lay the foundation for future success? So for a lot, a lot of you, the way to do that is to say, I know this, this, these approaches, and this grant is going to help me add these other approaches. That sets me up for better success. And I've seen that all kinds of ways. I want to work on infectious disease research. I've worked at the bench, but I need to develop some ability to do field work, some ability to understand. Um, um, epi, right? That's going to prepare me. I've seen people say, I, um, I can do the behavioral work, but I need to learn some of the genetic underpinnings of this anyway, but it has to be value added that you're adding skills and the money from the grant and the, the time that the grant gives you helps you add those skills, making your launch pad for success bigger at the next step. So hopefully that makes sense. Usually in the room, I can see people nodding or I can look at people's faces. So um, I have to say, this is a hard one to teach uh, without being able uh, to see what's happening. So this is sort of how does, how do I see myself in the future and how will this current grant help me? And then the next section, the career development plan, goes into more detail. So there you've laid it out where you wanna be and what your gaps are. And now you're gonna fill those gaps in your career development plan or add those enhancements. Sometimes it's not filling a gap. You can think of it as adding an enhancement. They really are the same, but some people like to talk about it differently. All right, so in the career development plan, you wanna focus on newer enhanced research skills and knowledge. 
You also want to focus on new or enhanced professional skills and knowledge. So by research skills, I mean, I really need to learn uh, coding and some computational work, or I really need to learn mouse genetics, or I really need to learn live cell imaging. I really need to learn how to uh, take a clinical protocol from IRB approval uh, into um, you know, my patient population. It's like, what new skills am I going to learn? Skills and knowledge. So it can be actual hands-on technical skills. It could be some coursework that you need to add. Depends at what level you are and what your background is, whether it will include coursework or not, but many of them include some coursework. By professional skills, I mean things like I'm going to need to teach uh, based on my career goals, so I'm going to make sure that I take a teaching class uh, next year, or I know that I'm going to be mentoring uh, medical residents, graduate students, summer interns. So I'm going to uh, take the mentoring course that's offered. I'm going to take the leadership course, the management course. I am committed to uh, a career uh, that involves teaching, mentoring, managing, um, and, and I realize I need an eye towards diversity. So I'm going to uh, get some training in allyship, training in um, you know, um, bystander uh, interventions. It's what professional skills do I want to learn to help me move forward? Now, a lot of those examples are focused on people uh, transitioning out of their postdoc and into a, a faculty job, right? But there are a lot of these grants that are from grads that are for grad students or early career postdocs. Maybe then the skills are grant writing, the skills are paper writing, presentations, right? It's whatever skills make sense at your point in your career. A lot of these awards are called mentored awards, which mean they want you to clearly talk about your mentor and your mentoring team, how and when you will interact with them, what each will provide during your training. Now, this was where there was a discussion about it has to be a famous senior person, and there are, um, there is no, there are no data to support that. However, if you have a very early career PI, brand new assistant professor, sometimes uh, people do say there's no track record of mentoring uh, people towards independent careers. And then you might want to add uh, a co-mentor or a mentoring team um, at UNC. And then a couple times actually here, I served as a co-mentor um, because uh, I had more uh, mentoring experience. So you can add a co-mentor. There were times when I I had somebody in my group was writing a, a K grant and I added a co-mentor because they were clinician scientists and I didn't know enough about the clinical side of their career. So we added a co-mentor. So you need to ask yourself, what does my mentor bring to the table? What are the gaps that my mentor has? If you're in the intramural program and your mentor has never looked for an academic job outside, then that's a gap and you might want somebody on your mentoring team who can uh, help fill in that gap. If you are a computational person and you want to learn bench work and your PI is much more computational, then you're gonna need a co-PI to fill in that gap, all right? So you wanna think about the, who your mentor is and add co-mentors as appropriate. Some K awards are not mentored, like the NIAD K-22, that said, many people in their reviews, there's questions raised about who will help you look for a faculty job or who will help. It seems like you're trying to learn some new skills. So even when they're not mentored, if your PI or the sponsor of the grant cannot help, it makes a lot of sense for you to include a co-mentor. A career development plan should list all the different activities, talk about how much time you're gonna spend on it, what are you gonna do in the first year, what are you gonna do in the second or third year, and also just explain how it relates to your research and career development plan. So a lot of times, hold on one sec. 
sorry, the phone rang right outside in the dining room. The joys of working from home. A lot of times people find a career development plan for someone else, from someone else and they say, great, this will be my career development plan. But if you don't talk about wanting to teach and that career development plan has a lot of teaching, um, you know, it doesn't look right. So you need to address what it is that you want to do. And then you want to write a career development plan that leads you in that direction. So I encourage you not to uh, just take somebody else's, but to say, who am I? Where am I at now? Where do I want to go? And what training helps? So I just wanted to break down the career development plan for you a little bit differently. And it's by these four bullets, technical training, right? What new techniques do I need to learn? Not small incremental advances of what you already know, but what's a big skill set that I'm gonna to add to my toolkit? Didactic training, which is in the classroom, professional training, communication, mentoring, teaching, management, grant writing, leadership, et cetera. And then job search information. All of these training grants and K grants are meant to leapfrog you to the next level. So who's going to help you with that? Strong career plans uh, go way beyond the standard stuff. So when people tell us, oh, I'm going <laughs> to, they're going to present in lab meeting, they're going to go to journal clubs, they're going to go to the obvious national meeting, we say, yes, so what? Everybody should be doing that. So it's value added stuff beyond what you should already be doing. It's based on your career goals and not an institutional template or somebody else's. It demonstrates that you and your PI or the mentor that you listed have engaged and interacted. So your letters, right? If you say that you're going to complete the entire management and mentoring series from OITE, it would help a lot if your PI said, and I'm very uh, committed to allowing them to complete this outstanding training offered on our campus. If you say I'm going to go to this Cold Spring Harbor course to learn this technique, it would help a lot if your mentor said they're going to go to this course, even if they don't get the grant, I'm going to pay for them to go. Strong career plans have a mentoring team when appropriate. I already gave some examples of that. And also they show evidence that you mean what you say. So if you list all these things and you've never gone to anything, we sort of wonder. So you might think about, and in some ways you're here. So, right, if you're gonna talk about grant writing, you can say, I've already started to attend some grant writing, but I'm gonna find more, right? Or I took the first part of the mentoring series, I'm going to apply for a mentoring award, and then I'm gonna complete the series. So you wanna sort of show evidence. Uh, that you mean what you're going to say. In terms of letters of recommendation, they should come from people who can talk about your prior experience, right? So what you've accomplished in the past and what you are committed to accomplishing in the future. So if you notice, that doesn't mean any particular type of grant awardee, right? It just means people who know you well and who can talk about you in very much greater depth uh, than, uh, oh, I meet them, I've watched them give a talk. People think, let me find a really famous big name person and that person will write me a letter and because they're famous, it will be great. But if they don't know you, it will not be great. Um, does it make sense if someone with a future career goal as a staff scientist applies for a K-99? No, it doesn't because um, you can only activate a K-99 if you uh, take on an independent position. Is there an expected limit to mentors there uh, that I'm aware of? There is not, but you should read, but I'm pretty certain there's not. If you have too many people, we're going to say you're going to be too busy meeting with them. So there is a sort of logical, not too many, but I don't think there's a number. What are the key elements of a career development plan? I just went over that. So I think you must have asked that before. Um, what is the typical projected output numbers of papers uh, you show you will make? Um, and then you put in parentheses. I know it depends from field to field. Uh, and from theoretical to experimental, uh, that is absolutely true. There is no number. I have never seen a grant 
that guaranteed a certain number of papers. I have seen lots of K grants that had a section on uh, learning, not, not for senior people, but uh, for grad students and early postdoc grants that talk about learning a lot about the publication process. We'll talk about, I hope to have a paper uh, based on the biochemical work and the animal work. I mean, they'll give some sense of publications, but I've never seen one that goes into um, uh, numbers in detail. In terms of research proposals, should we mention collaborators? If a collaborator is critical to your work, then it is critically important that you list that person and have a letter. Just to say I'm going to collaborate with so-and-so or I'm going to find a collaborator is not enough. There's a comment here about K99s that it has to be within four years from the date of defense. I'm going to encourage everybody like I have from the beginning to check the FOAs. Furthermore, in regards to extensions for COVID, keep checking the website. So I'm not going to make a firm comment there because um, uh, of that. However, that is true that there's very strict eligibility window for the K99 R00. Are there limits for K awards in terms of how long an applicant can be a postdoc uh, before applying? Yes, there absolutely are. Some Ks uh, have different limits than other Ks. Some are four years, some are more. You really want to read the FOA and check the eligibility. Also in that eligibility section, they will talk about what counts and doesn't count for a physician scientist. It talks about parental leave. And now obviously there are issues around COVID impact on research. So I cleared the Q&A again. So let's wrap up by talking about the critiques of grants. And I just want to include this slide here of common criticisms. I have talked about all of these, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but it's a great slide for you to pull out uh, and look at, right? So all kinds of things from I can't tell why this is important to it's an unrealistic amount of work to they don't have any experience in any of the required methodologies to I can't tell they don't know the published work, so this isn't placed well within the field all kinds of criticisms. Two things related to K grants and training grants, lack of evidence that the fellow and mentor work together and a lack of detail in the training plan. All right, so you wanna keep those in mind. Now, reviewers don't say things as directly as you would hope. So here are some things uh, that come right. These happen to come for the most part from my reviews because I'm long past. Um, a time when uh, it bothers me at all to share these. So this is the first of three very long aims that could make its own proposal. The sub aims just go on and on. Remember I said less is more. We just get nervous and we add more and I way overdid it. An important question and an elegant approach. That's really nice. I like to hear that. However, there is no discussion of how many targets are expected. Most importantly, what criteria will be used to select which targets to pursue. And I addressed that earlier in the research. When I was talking about research plans, we have to tell people what we expect to see and how we're going to deal with too many, too little, uh, an inability to measure a certain thing. The role of these senior scientists needs to be defined. That's somebody who thought, I'm not an expert in this. I will just borrow expertise from others. They listed a bunch of senior scientists and we're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? This is a horizontal contribution to the field. That was in my very first grant that hurt like crazy, but it was such a great piece of information. Remember I said significance matters a lot. And the way I had pitched that grant, it wasn't, a, it wasn't very significant. I did it in this cell model. I'm going to do it in that one. So that's called a horizontal contribution. That really, really crystallized my thinking about what's an NIH grant, what's a foundation grant, what's a university grant. How do we handle sort of big picture significance yet getting work done? The investigator does not pay su sufficient attention to feasibility, including the enrollment of research subjects, careful attention to inclusion issues. Remember, human subjects have has a separate section of its own, but it also plays a role in whether the experiments can work or not. So this is a great example from uh, um, a project with uh, research subjects 
um, about how you can uh, get caught. So a lot of those send you the message of asking too much, too little. Did I show I can do this? <coughs> Did I give them a real sense of how I'm going to deal with the ups and downs of this research? Now, all of us at some time in our career will get a negative review, many of them, in fact. You know, I love writing grants. I have a lot of positive feelings about the grant writing experience. I was, I wrote grants in some really difficult uh, economic downturns where it was hard to get funded. I wrote grants in times when it was a little bit easier to get funded, but it's never easy. It's always, right, even in good times, about one in four. So we all get negative reviews a lot. The first thing is give your time, give yourself the time and space to be sad, angry, disappointed. Remember, people are watching. You don't want to be sad, angry, disappointed in front of everybody, especially if you're a new PI. You tell everybody, oh my God, this is terrible, I've fallen apart. They're going to say, like, oh, maybe I shouldn't stay. Right. So we need to really find a way to deal with the ups and downs. The Becoming a Resilient Scientist series that we offer at NIH that we have offered multiple times to people both at NIH and outside NIH. The real frustration to me is that a lot of earlier career scientists come, postdocs don't tend to come, senior graduate students sort of talk to the hand, I don't need this. But the honest truth is the ups and downs of science require us to have incredible resilience and incredible emotional regulation or else we take our frustration about negative reviews out all around and it doesn't work. You should not call or write your program officer until you've calmed down. It does not help to yell at them. You should read the reviewer's comments very, very carefully. And after that, you need to decide whether or not the reviewers are enthusiastic and whether or not you will resubmit. So you need to get advice from senior scientists who have experience reading critiques your program officer, you'll want to reach out and ask their thought and opinion, but you want to do all of that when you're calm. I had a way of dealing with reviews. I looked at the score. I got over it. If I was angry, my dog, his name is Teo. Uh, he has an email account, teo at gmail.com. I would write an angry email to Teo, right? No big deal. I'm not going to uh, say something I regret to a program officer. I'm not going to lose it in front of my lab or my department chair or friends. I'm not going to take my really bad mood home to my wife. Um, and then, uh, right, I take discomfort at work and it uh, runs into discomfort in life. Then I would pull those reviews out and I would highlight in one color all the good things that they said. And that would let me realize, well, there are parts here that they like. Then I would highlight the things that are just small oversights that they want fixed. I'm like, well, I could do that. And then I would highlight the really big things. And by then I realized there were pluses, there were things that they liked, there are some things easy to fix and suddenly, oh, I could tackle that. And then I would get advice. If you resubmit an application, you must respond to the reviewer's criticisms. You don't have to agree or make the suggested changes, but you have to respond. People want to know what was done differently, which is why I said not to um, resubmit the exact same grant. We're going to be like, why did you do that? Even if you think the reviewers were slightly incompetent, and I hope I'm going to get better reviewers, usually there are some things where clearly you weren't clear, clearly you weren't clear, haha, <laughs> clearly you weren't as precise, you didn't provide the, the, exactly what was needed, so you always have to respond to the reviewers' critiques. If you really feel there was uh, bias or a reviewer that really didn't understand, you can talk to your program officer. Uh, after you get your reviews and before um, before council, and that sometimes is addressed at council, but very, very often after we collect ourselves, we realize there are flaws that we can fix. Not always. The peer review process has issues, a lot of issues, right? It also has lots of strengths. Um, 
Another really important thing to keep in mind is we don't want to attack the reviewer's confidence, their ability. It only hurts your cause. We circle the wagons. We see you, you know, reviewer one in the last review, you know, is a really incompetent review. And we're like, oh, now you're going to say that about us next time. So you want to be all that anger, all that frustration, all that, um, you know, fear, right? Because we need these grants to keep our labs going. All of that has to be dealt with before you rewrite your application. Appreciate that there's no guarantee that an amended application will score better than the previous ones, even though it goes to the same reviewers. I mean, the same study section, it can be different reviewers, different panel of applications. So it can be really frustrating. I thought I would just show you a few from mine. All right, um, absolute agreement. Reviewer one accurately pointed out, right? I'm like, I agree that we had not sufficiently discussed the detergents used to prepare cell lysates for our analysis. We now expanded this discussion in AIM-3 of the revised application. Sometimes I'll even say in AIM-3A, C page, whatever. In this case, it was a big generic thing. Here's the honest truth. I thought it was silly. I'm like a biochemist. I knew a lot about detergents. I don't think I really needed to point out that there are anionic and cationic and I was gonna use this one or that one, but what the hell, it's easy for me to say reviewer one accurately pointed out and added it. Now, sometimes we agree, but we don't do what people wanted. So here's another one. Reviewer two pointed out that we lacked a clear way to address the relevance of these protein interactions in an animal model. Reviewer two wanted me to do experiments in the CF mouse. First of all, I don't have any mouse protocols. Second of all, I don't know. There are strengths to that model, but for me, it wasn't the best choice. So I don't say I'm gonna disregard that because I don't agree with you. I just use this soft language. There are no universally accepted models for CF lung disease. So I don't say, I think you're wrong. I don't say anything except there aren't any universal models, but now we've included this instead. So they asked for A, I gave them B, but still in a generous way. Reviewer two pointed out, right? So that's sort of agreement. Now we can also graciously disagree. This is uh, from a long time ago now, but I still remember how frustrated I was and how hard it was for me to write this. We wholeheartedly agree with reviewer two that unfocused research can indeed lead to a quagmire of proteins. I wanted to do a screen for more interactions. A one and two were to characterize exciting interactions that we had found. We had already published on a third interaction. I'm like, I found three. Surely you should give me some money to let me find more. And some reviewers loved it, but reviewer two did not, right? So, and they said this quagmire of proteins, which I, sort of went out, right? Like I'm smart enough not to do that. I mean, I was really, really angry. However, we have several strategies in place to ensure that we do not go down such a path specifically. And then I give more information. And so then I say, therefore we've retained the protein interaction screen described in AIM-3 of the original application. They told me to take it out and I chose to leave it in. I just explain why as clearly and respectfully as possible. So this is what it means to graciously disagree. Now, my right, I get to choose. The honest truth is I did not get the grant the second time. <laughs> so again, uh, people were split. Some people loved the non-hypothesis driven exploratory aim. Some people didn't like it. And I just fell on the edge of not getting money. I turned it around, I pulled part of it out. I submitted it to somewhere else, and then I got the grant. Your choice whether to listen or not. And the thing is that a reviewer could give you bad advice, right? So you could listen, and then the next reviewer says, I'm so sorry they took that out. It's really needed. That's all of the sort of big decisions that you have to make as you're putting a grant together. You get to live with your decision. And in this case, I chose to say to reviewer two, I'm not going to listen. And so I got to write it again, my choice. I just want to end with this great quote. This is when Apple released uh, their Mac, uh, the Air laptop. Simple can be harder than complex. 
You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple, but it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. A lot about grant writing is taking really complex things, keeping it complex enough, but distilling it down enough that people get really behind it and are excited about it. It's you taking something really complicated and making it understandable to a broader area. And so I think it's just a great way to end an introduction to grant writing. I wanna say one last thing and then I'll take one more round of questions. It's more than just the science and two observations. Strong writing does not compensate for bad ideas. All right, so you can be a great writer, but if you have lousy ideas, we might say this is a well-written grant. However, the aims aren't founded in reality. It's missing a lot of things. However, weak writing easily ruins good ideas, easily. And this is not um, meant as a warning because the honest truth is everyone can learn to write well. Furthermore, um, everyone can finish early enough to have to get some help with editing. For some people, English is not their first language and writing a grant in English of 12 pages is a lot, right? For others, English might be their first language, but writing is not uh, a, a strong skill yet. It needs to keep developing for both, regardless of whether English is your first language or not, right? Grant writing is a learned skill. When I think of my first grant compared to my 10th or 20th or 30th grant, I cringe at those first ones. It's a learned skill. So we have to learn to write well. We have to find resources to help with that. And we need to... Um, have people read and edit and give us feedback. We can't be so invested in people telling us good job that we don't uh, seek out critical input. The thing about grant writing is unfortunately there are many more good applications than money. So only some of the deserving applications can be funded, which means we really have to work hard to maximize our chances for success. So we start early, we remember our target audience. We show reviewers that we've thought really deeply about the project. We try to critique things on our own in advance so that we can address the things that we're worried about. We prepare a reader-friendly application and we find a way uh, to remain optimistic in a really, really challenging time. I think that, again, um, I'll stress, that a big part of success in grant writing is learning how to take care of ourselves, learning how to be resilient, learning how to control ourselves in the ups and downs of science. Here are some really great uh, helpful things. Um, grant application basics, uh, information on study sections. If you're an NIH intramural fellow, you'll want to check our website for grants you're eligible for. We don't have a fully up-to-date um, uh, list, but it's pretty up to date and you want to, if you're going to submit a K grant, reach out to your intramural training director. So with that, um, I will keep uh, answering questions for a few more minutes. You say to avoid a horizontal project at the same time, uh, you have to show you already have the skill. Um, so in essence, everything seems horizontal. Not exactly. We have skills that we apply to new problems. So horizontal is I did it in these cells, so I'll do it in these and these and these. Or I did it with this one protein and I'm gonna do it now with a second one. Using a set of tools to answer new problems can be very much a novel new contribution. So if that, doesn't, if that answer didn't help and that example didn't help, um, uh, send me an email. All right. Um, I, off the top of my head, cannot recommend any books on grant writing, um, but there are some great uh, blog posts. Uh, the NIH extramural grants.nih.gov has resources. Um, I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I don't have any recommendations. Preliminary data sometimes contains proprietary information that a lab may not want to disclose. If you're not willing to disclose the preliminary data, then you can't use it. And so um, that's really your decision. I presented in my grants lots of preliminary data that I um, you know, wasn't published yet. 
Um, if I was uh, trying to patent something and there were really real issues, I would seek guidance and advice. Um, I wouldn't submit a grant really dependent on that because saying, hey, I, I did this great work, but I can't tell you about it is not going to help with uh, getting a grant. So you'll have to resolve that issue for yourself in deciding what's worth showing, uh, what's not worth showing. Do you have an opinion about whether it's a good idea to request specific uh, reviewers? Um, oh, specific referees to hit certain points about you. You mean in writing letters of reference. Um, I think that it makes sense to think about who are your biggest advocates and champions who knows you well and who can write a strong grant about this, right? So this is a research grant. So do they, have they heard me give talks? Do they know about my collaboration skills, my mentoring skills, my ability to learn new things? Um, and so you should ask the people who can address that the most. You can have one uh, grant one letter from someone who's sort of a sort of global mentor, career mentor, who can't talk that much about your science, but can talk about sort of your bigger package of what you've learned and developed, but there need to be people who can really address your science. Um, should you offer to write a draft for them? You can offer to write a draft. I personally, myself, um, <coughs> don't ask for that. I, I think it's um, part of my responsibility. If I say yes, I should be able uh, to find the time. But people are very pressed, and some people think it's a great exercise to ask people to write them. You can certainly offer that, and they might say, oh, yes, uh, I would really uh, appreciate if you do that. However, if you do that, um, read a little bit about what goes into a strong letter of recommendation. Read a little bit about unconscious bias in letter writing, about uh, sort of more male-oriented traits, more female-oriented traits. There's a lot of data that shows unconscious bias in letters of recommendation and letters of support, uh, both around gender and race and ethnicity. So if you're going to write your own letters, make sure uh, that you learn about that. And anyway, you're going to write letters for people who work for you. And so as part of all of our responsibilities to diversify science, take some time to read about bias in letter writing. All right, it is 4.07 and we have cleared the questions. So uh, we will get, um, we will get um, the information uh, out uh, the slides out to all of you. There's a discussion here in the chat about four years uh, for K99s. I encourage you to please talk with a program officer um, about things like I had a gap between my graduation and the start of my postdoc and make sure that you get clarification on all of those things. There are all kinds of things that factor into that clock and things that don't factor into that clock. But uh, Christy is correct that the K99 uh, has a four-year window modified uh, at this point. All of the grants have uh, impact of the um, pandemic, but you should uh, read it in the RFA. Stay safe, everyone. Be well. Take care. Lori Conlin will send you all of the slides by email. And thank you all very much.